thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Sure, you're welcome. A pleasure. Always uh, willing to share the limited knowledge that I have with others that I think reinforces the scripture. Uh, I think people have a uh, need to know that there's a lot more factual uh, things in the Bible that gives you uh, a solid base for the uh, rest of it to come around. Amen. And for those of you that are, we're, we're, we are recording, and for those of you that are catching on to this when uh, you're listening to this, this is Gil Broussard, and he's agreed to take some time out of his very busy schedule to talk with us and share the things that he's been led to discover and uncover and share with the world. And many of the things that, again, he's been talking about uh, some of you have run across his material on uh, YouTube. Uh, he's he's become YouTube famous, as as my uh, teenage daughter says. Um, and uh, this is a an extraordinary uh, blessing to our house and to all those that listen uh, concerning the things that are lining up right now uh, to confirm Bible prophecy and to confirm that the ancient scriptures and the recordings of the ancients are not irrelevant but in fact are accurate and foretell many things that we need to be sensitive to. Now as a bit of a backdrop uh, I'm an amateur at this. I, I watch the sky only for new moons and for slivers and uh, uh, you know uh, blood moons and things like that. In fact, October we had October to November we had here on the Sea of Galilee we had a phenomena where we saw the rise of I believe it was five blood moons, uh, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, in late October into uh, the first part of November. So October 30th, 31st, the, the first, the second, and then the sky went overcast. We don't know if that was natural or unnatural, but we couldn't see the moon for two days and then caught it again. So, And it was red every time. And people were asking me, you know, did you did, did you go down to the street? And it was 3 a.m. the last one. You know, of course not. We just took photographs. But, but it really did happen. And we put it out there on the Internet. And, of course, a lot of people saw that. So, so I know for a fact that he uses the signs in the heavens as, uh, or the, the, the celestial bodies as signs. This is what he does. I've talked a lot about this. But without further ado, Gil, I'd like you to just, I know you sent me a PDF file with, a number of different topics that you could touch on and we don't want to be disrespectful to your time at all so please share as much as you can I know that they just came up with the biblical king um, royal seal unearthed in Jerusalem if you want to start there and talk about how that relates to uh, what's on its way um, you, the floor is yours okay uh, to start off with Hezekiah um Remember when the uh, shadow had went backwards uh, in uh, some people's uh, text it, it may mention that it was a sundial. Well, the uh, the math and the science doesn't work well with a sun uh, sundial. So we went back to the Hebrew to check and it says uh, it, the shadow went backwards on steps. And that made a lot more sense because if you face the steps, the uh, north and south, you have a tilt of the earth of 26 to 28 degrees, which is uh, proven out in two other incidences uh, in history that I can find that uh, the earth has tilted before of 26 to 28 degrees. And uh, what's interesting about Hezekiah's seal, it shows a winged disc, which is common throughout history pertaining to this planet. The wings on the disc, the wings actually means flight or movement in the sky. The disc is representing the planet, sometimes called a sun or illuminated body in ancient Hebrew, as well as the Greek. Uh, helios means illuminated body as well. Sometimes it's misinterpreted in the text as sun, but it, when you bring it back, to, because often the moon is mentioned, so people assume that the other illuminated body is the sun, and, but that's an assumption. Because anytime you read in the text, 
when there's a double eclipse, when the moon and sun are darkened, that does not happen in the natural. It takes a third object to darken both both the sun and the moon at the same time because let's take, for instance, Yeshua's sacrifice. There was a three-hour darkness and it was on a full moon. Full moon's on the opposite side of Earth. It takes the moon to make a solar eclipse which is a new moon and it can only give you 7.3 to seven and a half minutes of darkness and that's only a spot on earth and that spot will roll out of the darkness after you know 7.3 minutes or so the text in the bible as well as outside text says the entire earth was darkened and it was the entire earth was darkened for three hours well guess what our model shows a three hour of darkness. We have found evidence in the Chinese writings of 1054. This is this is white paper, uh, white paper report, scientific papers. This is not hearsay. Uh, that the supernova of 1054 uh, was seen about two or three months than the typical text state, and that the uh, main writings when they went back to misreview this. They found that this object moved in multiple, was moving through multiple constellations. Well, supernovas don't move. They're stationary. They can't be viewed in multiple constellations. And this object was seen for 26 months. That is a very large object to be able to be viewed for that length of time. And its entry and exit, when we plot it, the Chinese documented it so well that we could plot a segment of its course and guess what that matched 150 to 152 day entry to exit crossing earth path twice once in its exit point is in Passover period of time and the other one is five months later where it entered previously where the debris field is still lingering and, uh, that is this fascinating. Is That's that's fascinating. Yeah. This this is mentioned in Noah's Noah's flood as 150 days, and then it's mentioned in Revelation as five months, and uh, they're both speaking about the same amount of time. And, Which, of uh, course, Messiah tied to when he said, uh, "As the days of Noah were." So. Uh, so what you're suggesting, if I understand you correctly, and I, again, I've been following along for those that are catching up, Gil has done a number of different interviews online and produced a number of material that if you look for it, you'll find it, uh, where he goes into great detail about how he came to, as a, a as beginning as a skeptic, which I like, um, and uh, and then slowly realizing what he was what he was uh, uncovering was secrets concerning well frankly how some of these cataclysmic events occurred and for example when you talk about the crucifixion which again happened on Passover middle of the month right. um, uh, or uh, uh, yeah middle of our, our Gregorian month it, it happens um, in a full moon like you said um, so you're you're not dealing with um, uh, uh, a typical eclipse, a typical experience, and yet that's not something that you would even hear talk or talked about because, again, and, and as soon as you say it, we go, oh, yeah, that's right, I guess that's true. <laughs> I never thought about that, and even if it was a lunar eclipse, it would only be seven and a third minutes. Um, so, yeah. wait a second, that doesn't make sense. How did they achieve that? And now, when you introduce a third body, when you introduce a a planetary body that gee what a coincidence that uh, you know the star of Bethlehem was also a planetary body that told some wise men where to go and what to do um, or or a convergence of planetary bodies if, if you will and so um, I, we know that the stars in the heavens we know that the heavens are accurate and as I, I like to quote and especially this this past season the moon is a faithful witness it, it can't be affected by humans, it can't be altered, it can't be played with. So 
it becomes the pure witness, the, the celestial bodies become pure witnesses that can't be affected or impacted by PR and by, by television programming or something, you know. So, um, so tell us more about, because I know that you are, you, you are not only looking now at uh, this window that's happening right now, and we can talk a little bit about that, but you're also very focused on Passover this coming year. And I want you to spend a little bit of time, if you wouldn't mind, telling us why you're focused on Passover. Well, one of the main reasons uh, you touched on it, uh, we'll start with that, as you were saying about the moon. Well, for instance, the moon in the Hebrew, not the English text, but in the Hebrew, Moon is first mentioned in Genesis 37, 9. And that was during the time of Joseph, when Joseph had his dream at age 16. When he said that the sun and moon and stars bowed to him. Well, looking at this with astronomy, I have a problem slightly with that because you can't see stars if the sun's out. So again, we're, we're looking at a word illuminated body. That's our third object right there. That he's, mm. that, he's, that he's looking at. Now, how do we know this? Okay. Well, remember when he was in, uh, later on when he was in Egypt, during the drought, remember? He was around age 40. By the time the mid, mid of the drought came, came around. So, how can we prove this story that it actually did happen? Well, there's an there's an artifact in Europe that's called the Nebra Sky Disk that was found in Germany in a Nebra colony they called it and there's a the world uh, Europe's oldest uh, observatory that's about uh, 20 miles or so uh, northwest of it and I believe that the disc, the disc was actually made at that ancient Miss Observatory. And what, this is a bronze disc with uh, gold, leaf, stars, sun, moon, and uh, it's your horizon markers on it. And it's the oldest in the world that represents a group of stars or constellations that we can recognize. And when I first saw this, uh, the museum text on this, I didn't agree with it, uh, and, uh, and I found some errors that they had missed. One, none of the experts caught that the moon was facing the wrong direction, that illuminated side has to be facing the sun. Therefore, they dated the crescent shape with the wrong date. Instead of saying that it was a four-day-old moon, it was actually like a 26-day-old moon. And that makes a difference in trying to find the time period that this is pictured at using a uh, software. And then it showed uh, the constellation to the left and uh, to the right of it. And uh, what it did was it, it framed to the right Capricorn and it framed to the left Gemini. Well, it shows the sun on the left and it shows the moon to the right. Well, what's interesting is you cannot see the stars unless it's the eclipse and the moon is the one that usually does the eclipse you know causes the eclipse for the sun but it can't be done in a crescent shape as it's shown on this disc it can only take a new moon to darken the sun so this this is clearly showing that the moon is not involved with this eclipse which the experts failed to pick up that was the second point. At the bottom, it shows the constellation o Orion. And from this latitude where the, where the observatory is, you cannot see Mr. Orion from Germany at that latitude in the month of April. Because it shows Capricorn to the right and Gem Gemini to the left, and that's April according to that, to that latitude. And the only way you could send, see Mr. Orion is if Earth tilted 26 to 28 degrees. It would give you a latitude of Luxor, Egypt. Now getting back to the story of Joseph. 
Remember, he had that dream at age 16 when the skies bowed to him. Yes. Well, remember the drought you have with this object, you, you have three and a half year drought coming in, three and a half year drought as it leaves. Joseph was mid of the drought. And the date on the disc, when we go back in the software model, gives us a clear date on when, when this happened. It was, uh, the, the software gives us April 6th of 1810 BCE. Now, you have to compensate, you have to subtract 16 years because the year actually changed at Hezekiah's time from 360 to 365 and a quarter, which is not compensated in, in the software. So you subtract 16 years from this and you get 1794 BCE, April which is the exact year it lands on Joseph, mid of the drought. Wow. wow. The skies literally bowed to Joseph at age 40 because your perspective, standing on earth looking at the sky, that's exactly what you've seen. The skies were bowing to him. The stars, the moon, and this illuminated object bowed to him. And this German disc confirms the story of Joseph along with the software. The software also confirms the yearly changed on Hezekiah. Uh, globally, calendars changed, uh, which is documented in over 80 countries, I believe, that uh, within a year to year, within two years of that date, close to 80 different countries change, change, change their calendar to 365 and a quarter. And you see it on Hezekiah's seal that the planet was passing. And the shadow going back 10 steps, the calculation gives us 26 to 28 degrees, but it's a north to south tilt. Same thing like Joseph. It was a north and south hill. Because when the two planets come close together, this planet pa passed approximately between halfway between the moon and the earth. And I know some of your guests would say, well, that's impossible because of gravity. Well, that's if you use uh, the wrong model, that it's a gravity-ruled universe. The new model of, a, of the physicists say that we live in an electric universe. That gravity is the weaker force and, and magnetic fields are the stronger force. And uh, that was proven out recently when, when a comet had passed by Mars. So the limit to gravity is actually called the Roche limit, which is one and a half times the radius of a, of a planet. That's where you get, any time past that, you get geosynchronous orbit. Uh, your satellites are not pulled back by gravity because gravity, it, it doesn't, uh, doesn't have enough force to pull it back. Now when these two planets pass like that, the magnetic attraction is like two magnets and they tilt toward each other, the opposite poles attract to each other. And you get a 26 to 28 degree tilt, which I can prove happened four times in history. One was at Noah's time, um, one was there in Joseph's time, one was there in uh, Joshua's long day, and the other one was in Hezekiah's time. So now are Hezekiah, you suggesting yeah. that this coming, uh, uh, because I know that you're focused on this, this coming season, and, you know, what you're sharing, uh, I agree with you. I, I don't know enough about the software itself, never have seen it, but I, based on what you're telling me, uh, and based on 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 uh, your uh, discoveries and analysis, I I don't have any reason to question that. So um, again, steering back to this window that we're in right now, with with uh, just having come through um, uh, the Festival of Lights, uh, uh, so and now seeing things in the heavens <laughs> and people are documenting more and more uh, we've had videos sent to me I've had some things sent to me that I didn't even post because I'm just scratching my head going can this possibly be real 
uh, we caught a picture of two two objects in the sky over Indonesia that I'm still scratching my head about. Um, so so talk to me about. I, I think we can give you that space and say, all right, assuming that your software is pretty accurate and that in fact we are an electric based universe versus the gravity base, uh, if you will. Tell me what what does that mean for us, for Earth? Well, just recently, see, once you have a theory, you need a uh, a real event, whether in laboratory or in nature, that proves out a theory and then it becomes fact. Okay. Well, the uh, there was a comet Fighting Springs. You may have heard about that. Yep. It was going to yep. pass very near Mars. Yep. Okay. Well. October 18th, Astronomy, if I remember. Yeah. yeah. There's two camps. The, the astronomy camp says the tail of a, a, of, of a comet is ice particles. And that gravity is the ruling force of the universe. The physicists say that the tail of a comet is plasma, electrically charged particles, and that there's no missing matter, there's no dark matter or... Uh, or dark energy that the vacuum of space is actually not a true vacuum that it's that it's filled with plasma okay hmm. plasma is clear that's where your 96 percent of missing matter is at it's in the form hmm. of plasma for state of matter okay now they're saying that when comet side springs was going to pass so close to Mars that there had been an electrical dis discharge between the two uh, objects so when NASA was watching it they had a close-up then when it just came about time when the tail would have crossed they pulled away and gave you a very far view for the public and then they came back and said that the uh, you know that there was a the sky lit up but yet none of their ro uh, uh, rovers on the planet or satellites got damaged well, there was an amateur astronomer out of Spain that went to the Canary Islands and set up, and he filmed it. And you can go on YouTube and, and look at this film or look at my second uh, video. Let me see. It's called the bonus video. I have bonus one and bonus two. He captured it in close up. And it and you saw Venus light up like you've never seen it before. It, it, it just exploded, it seemed like, the, uh, you see the atmosphere. The, you see Aurora and everything. There was some sort of lightning bolt or something that went across between the two. Mm -hmm. And that proved it right there that the physicists were correct. Because ice particles don't do that. Right. I agree with you. Now... We don't, we, we don't have 50 years for the books to change before we can accept this. We have a live, an exam we have, we have a live example, which is science. No longer theory now. Earth is going to travel through this tail of this comet again. And where do we have a model for that? Joshua's long day. When we take the Chinese overlay the exact model, and we put Earth coming into it, the, the plasma tail points opposite of the sun at all times. It doesn't, pa uh, doesn't usually point of the path, the, of, of its path. It always swings away from the sun. This time it's swinging and Earth is entering into the plasma field. And what happens is energy coming into the north and south pole of Earth is reduced by four and a half to five and a half percent compounded hourly for the next 24 to 28 hours. Guess what? Earth comes to a complete stop. Whoa. Just like the story of Joshua. Long day. Whoa, did you people hear that? Did you hear what he just said? We wow. have an actual model that proves out Joshua's long day. The Earth can slow down without mile high tidal waves. 
you may have coastal flooding, but you don't have, you know, how scientists used to laugh that, well, how do you stop the earth to just come to a complete stop? You'd have all the oceans emptied out onto the continent. Yes, you're right if it, does, if it did do that, but that's not the way it occurred. It's just like a dimmer switch reducing the power of Earth's rotation, four and a half to five and a half percent compounded hourly. Within 24 to 28 hours, Earth comes to a complete stop. Remember Whoa. in Revelation, it says the angels hold back the winds. The whoa, wind. whoa, 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 whoa. You can't wow. have the winds slow down unless you, you stop the Earth. That's what causes the wind. Wow. Are you hearing this, people? Are you listening to what this man is saying? Wow. You just so, tied together some things that I, I you know, and, and you, you head off a few questions that I was going to, because that was where I was going. Well, you know, there are certain scriptures that talk about the angels at the four corners of the earth. Um, there are things that we know, and we, and we don't always know if they mean it spiritually, or if it's natural, or if it's both, so we have to wait, you know, and that's part of the process of, of uncovery, of the mysteries being revealed. This is a huge mystery being revealed. What I have found out is, when it's spiritual, it says spiritual. When it's uh, when it's a uh, a parable, it's a parable. But for us to put something and say it's a parable without him saying it is, is wrong of us. Mm. It's factual. He's meaning it the way he said it. Now, so I getting back, okay. So getting back to this, so yeah. you're you're saying the Earth can stop, and and again, I'm trying to get our minds around. Uh, because again, we're watching. I, I'm, you know, I'm here at the Sea of Galilee. Um, I'm seeing things here. I, you know, I didn't realize uh, when I came here. I didn't even know that it was below sea level here. Um, so we get angles that you don't. Get, and the sky is brighter than I've ever seen. There's not. The, 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 you don't have quite the noise pollution that you have, you know, in the in the West. And and um, I'm able to see things that I never saw before. So I am absolutely riveted. Uh, I have a beautiful deck, and I'm able to see things. So, so when you pointed out in a few videos, I don't remember which one, but I was listening to an interview that you talked about that you were watching very closely to the constellations during Hanukkah and in this season because it would portend some things that may or may not. Obviously, we have to wait and see. So I'm not asking you to predict necessarily, but to give me your insight uh, based on what you're seeing in the heavens and how it lines up with what you're discovering. You see, it's passed the same route four or five times. Remember when Earth tilted four, four, four times. And if they would have been looking at it in the sky, remember every 2,000 years, the constellation shifts over one. Okay, every 2,100 years, the next month will be over. It would be a different constellation. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, they had their path that they were looking at. And so, uh, what's interesting is, if we could see it right now, it would be under Job's, what's called Job's coffin. And astronomers don't know why it's called that. It's just been carried throughout. But the word coffin in Hebrew means confined area or defining an area. And Job's coffin is just exactly like if you close your fist and point your finger out, that's the shape of it. And that finger points to the ecliptic, but just not anywhere on the ecliptic, the exact point where this object does retrograde motion, where it, bounce, it dances two to three times underneath there, and that's the midpoint of the retrograde motion of it. Now, who could have did that? Hmm. And then, there's a date. Uh, let me qualify this. I don't have a crystal ball. I can't tell the future. But I just want to point out in Revelation, Revelation 12, 1, since the Gregorian calendar did not exist at the time of Yeshua, when, mm -hmm. or when John wrote this uh, book here, of Revelation. It gives the date the only way they could have given it. The stars. 
It says, the woman with the moon at her foot. Well, if it says moon, where are we looking at? In the sky. What woman is that? Virgo. It says a woman with a with moon at her foot with a crown of 12 stars. Leo is 11 stars when it's drawn like a lion. The 12 star is the Jupiter, the king planet, which always announces the coming of the Messiah. My God. Now, then it says it's clothed with the sun. That word sun in Greek is helios, illuminated body. Is it the sun? Can't be, because the sun, the stars... Are you wouldn't be able to see out. it if it were the sun. You, 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 it, Correct. you wouldn't be able to see that. And the other qualifier says only Virgo is illuminated, not Leo. The sun illuminates all of them. Yep, amen. Guess what? When we look at the model as this is a comet, when it gets past us, it illuminates only Virgo, as the text qualifies. Whoa. That'd be hard to now, miss. What, well, this even gets a little bit deeper than this. If I would have given them the software 2,000 years ago, they still could not have picked up this date. Out of the blue, they couldn't have done it. Tell me why. Remember, remember uh, 2,000 years ago, during the time of Passover, was the scales of Libra, scales of judgment. Sure. Or, or paying a debt, whichever way you wish. That's what was in the skies at midnight. Okay. Midnight, Jerusalem time, on this day, is this, this, this scene I just described to you. After a 12 hour rotational delay. This is what you wow. see midnight from Jerusalem. That night in Jerusalem will be 24 hours. Now I'm not saying midnight, that's a modern term, mid of night. See, midnight is six hours after sunset. That's mm -hmm. not mid of night on this particular day. Remember it says in the Bible, I will make day into night and night into day? Correct. That's because of the 12 hour rotational day. Now noon is, is, uh, is midnight and midnight is noon. This is also the false miracle of the Antichrist. But let me get back and me digress here for a moment. The, like I told you, if I would have given them a software 2,000 years ago, they could still not pick this date. Because they'd have to know the physics which we, which we just got. They'd have to know mechanical, uh, uh, orbital mechanics. They'd have to They'd have to also know the earth was going to slow down by 12 hours, like in Joshua. The earth would have went through the tail as the model shows. They also had to predict when this planet was going to return, which does not have a set orbit. It has an erratic orbit because there's too many things that's influencing it. And not just, not just predict the date, but predict the hour of its return. And get it where it's exactly three and a half days after past the Feast of Passover. When Elijah and them come. Remember, they're dead for three and a half day, uh, days at the end. Remember, they prophesied for 1,060 oh, yes. days. Oh, yes. And then they're dead for three and a half. Well, the word prophesy, the root word provide, is to profess, to speak. They can't speak if they're dead. So how many days are there on earth? You have to add three and a half days to the 1,260 days. And that, that means that they're ahead of the bride going into hiding three and a half days. Hmm. And we know that Elijah comes at the Feast of Passover, which is a full moon. Three and a half days later, guess what? This March 26th that this software model shows us. How did they get that right?
Wow. It's impossible to dig that big. So what is it what is it telling you based on the model that you've now uh, dialed in only, and calibrated. The only way that they could have got in there is the Almighty Himself gave it to Yeshua and Yeshua gave it to John and it's written in there. It can't be done by human hands or thoughts to be put in there. So I can only say as a human myself, this date greatly concerns me. <laughs> I like the way you put that. Uh, and, and as I like to tell those that listen to our channel and those that have been following, do not uh, over-focus on what he may or may not do, but instead you get ready because, as Gil just said, this date greatly concerns me. Well, what he's saying is you better have your act together. You had better, if you needed to repent for something, you had better have already done it. If you uh, are trying to finish a work that he's given you to do, you had better get to that uh, because we are quickly running out of time. And, and whether or not there's, you know, who knows, uh, we can all speculate about, well, what about this and what about that and, and adding this time or adding that time. Again, we are in a jubilee year. Every millennium ends with a jubilee year. So we have to be sober and vigilant like never before. So what you're saying is this coming Passover season is pretty important. Well, let me give you a qualifier. You just mentioned Jubilee. Remember the previous conversation we had about the Niebuhr disc? Yes. Well, when we can pinpoint the mid of the drought, now we can pinpoint... Jacob, who was renamed Israel, and how many uh, four years in captivity? Then they entered Canaan. It, this gives us the exact counting from that point. Every jubilee of fifty years. This next jubilee is the seventieth jubilee, like in Daniel said. In 1947 when it was decreed for Israel to go and to be built, 1947, the UN wrote the decree. If you had a bar mitzvah age 13, where you're a cob as a witness, that meant he's uh, 83. Okay? But from 1947 yep. to 2016, it's 70 years. Now, being 83, the Bible already tells us, the scripture tells us, this generation shall not die out till all is fulfilled. It can't be the next jubilee. There'll be 133. Yeah, it, and uh, you and I agree on that. We might quibble over what is the length of it, you know, because it's a 70 to 80 years and people have debated it. It doesn't matter. What matters is these things yeah. are starting to line up to tell everyone, look up, your redemption draws nigh. And that is the message. Whether or not, you know, you, we, we, people, again, and I'm not, I don't want to stir up debates on, on, on minor things because what Gil is saying here is wake up, look up. There are things lining up that are of uh, cataclysmic proportions. This is not a light matter. Tell us what happens when this rotational uh, event occurs. Tell us, you said, you know, we won't have those tidal waves that, that you know, obviously everybody says it's, you know, and I've heard science or science-oriented people say this couldn't happen because tidal waves would wipe out everything and, and so on and so forth. So tell me, what should be expected should that model prove accurate? Well, um, We would, the uh, winds would, it's exactly what Revelation is telling you. Revelation happens to have the sequence of events correct as we would look at a scientific model of this type of catechism, uh, catastrophic event. The Bible qualifies this next event as being the worst time in all of Earth's history. Well, if Noah's flood happened and that's not the worst, 
is qualifying this next time as being the worst in all of Earth's history. So get a grip on that for a moment. And when Earth starts to enter the plasma field, it will start to slow down. And it will take about 24 to 28 hours. Now, all generators will be turned off almost three days prior to the crossing, when Earth starts to cross the debris field. There's not enough batteries in the world for flashlights. If you ever been in a hurricane, shelves are cleared in three days. You know, after about four hours of use, you, it, it, your light's gone just about. Uh, we're burning oil lamps again. Remember the bride, wise and foolish, Come on. oil in her lamp? In a Hebrew wedding, remember in the English it says virgin, but in, in uh, Hebrew there would have been Bertuzza, which meant maiden. They're bridemaids. Only bridemaids carry lamps. 144,000 are brides. The wise and foolish uh, maiden or bridemaids because they have lamps in their hands because they they light the way for the groom and the bride but there's a qualifier there only the wise make it and what makes them wise the wives have two portions of oil literal oil olive oil in the lamp remember what I just told you about the sequence where the earth is extended by night is extended on, on Jerusalem side by 12 extra hours. A portion of all is, is for 12 hours. The wives have two portions. The foolish only have their lamps filled. So when the first 12 hours are burnt, the wives are trimming their whips, wicks, and refilling their lamps and the foolish is asking for uh, more oil and they said no go and buy you some because there's not enough for you and as and as they left and they're finishing trimming their wicks and filling their lamp a shout is given out and the groom is coming only the wives go out and meet him with the uh, bride The foolish end up knocking, saying, let us in. And he knows them, and they know his name. What does he tell them? Go away, for I do not know you. That's right. They, fail, they failed the test. They failed the test. They failed what? They failed the test. They failed the examination. You see, so it's many people, they, they want to wait until... Uh, you know, Gil, this is this is the attitude of a lot of people. And you know, you know what it's like. You were a skeptic. I mean, you came at this from a skeptical point of view. You admit that, which I respect. Um, and, and to some degree, I think we all do. We all want to know, come on, I want to know for a fact. I've got a family. I've got, I, I want to know that this is, I don't want to make preparations for something and get, you know, egg on my face, if you will. And the reality is, is that it is the rehearsals uh, that get us ready and so even if there were a few more rehearsals that's to your benefit uh, so that you are more attuned to what you need to get ready for uh, I am sure grateful having been in the military that we did a lot of drills because when we finally were in a battle situation off the coast of Iran or uh, off the coast of Vladivostok, Russia we didn't all have to ask what, what do we do we all knew where to go we all knew where we were supposed to be so uh, this is incredibly important, and I thank God for people like you who are helping people like me uh, sound an alarm and say, you need to trim your lamps, you need to be prepared, you need to have your double portion of oil in the natural and in the spirit and in every way possible because preparation is not something you do after you see confirmations. It's something you do in advance of those confirmations. Remember now you're saying... Go ahead. Remember the book of Esther, of Esther course, where yes. she's a bride and she fasted for three days? Okay. After Elijah sits at the feast of Passover and announces the groom is coming, we're full. We're, we had a feast. After that, we fast. Because three, that last third day is a half a day longer in hours. So that third day is actually three and a half. And... 
and that's when he returned. But he's on Joel, uh, second chapter, 30, 32, he qualifies everything you need to know right there. He says, there'll be, well, let me read it. That'd be even better. Give me just a second here. Okay, verse uh, 30. Because I shall give signs in the heavens. All right, what sign are we looking for? The sign of Jonah, actually, or our planet. And I'll describe why it's the sign of Jonah later. Okay. And upon okay. the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Blood and fire, con that's volcanic activity or it could be meteor showers. The sun is turned into darkness and the moon into blood. There's a double eclipse right there. Can't have it in the natural. That's our planet. Before the coming and the gr uh, great and awesome day of Yehovah. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of Yehovah shall be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be an escape. As Yehovah has said, and among the remnant whom Yehovah has called. Remnant does not mean entire body. No, it does not. Wilderness does not mean heaven. No, it does not. Taking away. This is the first taking away, and we're not going ahead. We're going into a wilderness. This is a modern-day exodus or everything. This is a practice around the test, whatever you wish to call it. But we got to be at Mount Zion in Jerusalem, midnight, mid of night, on this day, possibly. But we, we, we have to qualify because there's going to be a sign in the heavens. We're not going by what I'm saying. We're going to go with the qualifier of the sign in the heaven. Now we know what the sign is, the sign of Jonah. Remember what he said? Only for adulterous and wicked generation, the only sign they'll have is the sign of Jonah. Hmm. Jonah lived during Hezekiah's time. Forty days prior to the event of the earth tilting, he went to Nineveh. And he went... Now... And they're seeing all these things coming, and they're seeing the signs and events and changes and crops and failures and animal dying and, and, and all these other things going, what's going on? And here comes the prophet to say, you need to repent. This is Peter Michael Martinez. I'm on the line with Gil Broussard, and what he has just told us is confirmation of what we've already known, that this is not a year to mess with. This is a year to be prepared to be sober, to be vigilant, to awaken the bride, to awaken the people of God, to awaken the remnant, the bridesmaids. Get oil in your lamps and get ready for the day of the King of Glory comes. Well, the only thing you had to do was point to the sky and point at an object because the software shows us that 40 days, that's when it's rounding the sun. You can see it at 40 days. That's exactly what the limits are on the software model that shows you this. And uh, remember, he said this is, this is the only sign the wicked and adulterous generation will have. I'm hoping that it's not qualifying us here. That it's only qualifying the world that's not ready for this. I'm hoping that we see it before this time period of 40 days. 40 days would bring you about February 15th or so, somewhere around there. So uh, that's why I'm hoping to see it possibly around the peace agreement, which may be around January 11th. We can get that by using Janu Dan Daniel's numbers because we have a fixed point to be referencing from, which is Mar March 26th. And uh, that means we should see a war, uh, first economic collapse and a war. Uh, in the near term. Probably Yes, in the near time, if it's this year, which, like I said, greatly concerns me. I can't, I don't have, I can't tell the future, and I'm not trying to prophesize. I'm just trying to point out that the Almighty gave us a date that's been there for two millenniums, and no one's pointed it out. Right, and, and I guess... I, that's, and there's my point. Rather than try and speculate, because that could get people 
Um, later on, they say, oh, well, this piece of speculation that you did turned out to be incorrect. Well, it was speculation. It wasn't, thus saith the Lord. Okay. But, right. you know, people, people will use that um, to say, oh, well, then I don't have to listen to the rest of this. No, listen, we can, we can sit around and speculate, but the bottom line remains the same. And I'm sure Gil would agree that if you have sin in your life, now is a good time to get rid of that. Uh, if you don't have oil, now is, to, good, now is like your opportunity, your window to get oil, um, both naturally and spiritually, and, and make your preparations. We have a, uh, a, and I don't know if you're following Remnant House at all, but that we're, we're planning on, on uh, we're telling people, plan, plan out, you know, um, prepare for an exodus. And uh, we're planning for, we've got a, a, an event here in Jerusalem, um, for Passover this year, which is part of the reason why I wanted to have you on the air because your understanding and the things that you've been unveiling only only punctuate the importance of observing and being sensitive to all of the major and minor feast days. Uh, because Hanuk Hanukkah is not really a major feast day, but still a window of watching. Um, and Purim is not, a, is not a major feast day, but again, still... Uh, you, you mentioned uh, you mentioned Esther. Um, uh, th there you have it. Another another window of watching. And so um, I think that the admonition is to be aware, pay attention, and don't take for granted that everything's going to be status quo. Because as you have clearly uh, pointed out, there is no way for the world to be status quo when this thing passes through. Now, again, I wanted to ask. You know, give an example. For example, you said, um, uh, you know, there there can be a stopping of the earth over a period of time that doesn't create mile high tidal waves, but that has to have some impact, like earthquakes and uh, volcanoes and other things. Am I right? Yes, of course. Uh, we will have. Remember, he said that earthquakes will be like. Uh, a woman giving birth there were escalate well, well we've already seen a dramatic escalation in fact I noted in, uh, right after the feast days there were 8800 earthquakes in uh, September through October in one month period that we, we tracked and we've been watching that closely so we've already seen and that was an uptick from uh, I started watching this closely in 2013 and and it's just continuing so I agree with you but what are you saying we're going to see the, the 10 point plusers that, uh, that he told me two years ago we should be on the lookout for? It is possible that we can have um, new ranges set. Not just in, in certain things like, okay, like they've already trying to uh, establish a higher unit of a hurricane. And tornadoes and uh, and even the uh, the way we do the uh, earth uh, earthquake uh, setting because this this was during a time period where we never went through what we're about to go through here remember what the Bible says every mountain and island is moved yes that's from one event what type of earthquake does that it says every wall on earth is cracked at that time. A fiery mountain hits earth so hard, earth is split, a third of the sea life dies, every wall on earth is cracked. The earth wobbles like a drunkard, like a hut in the wind. That is the description that follows a model of an impact of an asteroid the size of a mountain. And that is event number two, five months later. That is done, Earth is hit on the nighttime side of Earth. In March, we're hit on the daylight side of Earth. So the safe side in March is the nighttime. Remember, Yeshua comes mid of night. Because it's a Hebrew custom for a groom to pick up his bride. That's why Elijah announces, so... You know, <laughs> it follows the Hebrew custom. 
And Amen. the bride, the bride uh, home, old home, is the old Jerusalem. Her new home will be the new Jerusalem. But in between that, the bride has to go to a mikvah to purify herself and to get her mind right for this type of marriage, to commit herself. That's why we're three and a half years in the wilderness, preparing ourselves for a wedding. At the end of the three and a half years, the bride in his lap. The, how does the wedding go? The groom and the father already in the in the uh, uh, hall. The guests enter first, then the bridesmaid, then the bride. Remember where it says that the least or most and the most are last. Least knowledge That's right. most knowledge. What did Yeshua say? My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So Gil, let me ask you a question. It's a bit of a personal question. I think I know the answer. <laughs> but, I, but I still want to ask on the air and in recording here. So what's your plan? I know that you're calling me from the United States right at the moment. At least I think that's where you are. Uh, what's your plan for this coming spring? You plan on staying in North America? Uh, if we see the qualifier, remember, it's not by what I say. He said you will see a sign in the heavens. This is right. how we qualify it. Sure, when, absolutely. When, when we see it, then we'll know the date. Israel's population is going to come close to doubling. You're going to have anywhere from three to five million people coming in. Because... Remember where it says the bride is 144,000? And they're only from Israelite tribes, except Dan is not mentioned. Okay? Well, that's the priestly group. Well, priests are allowed to marry in Hebrew, you know, in the Hebrew custom. Well, you multiply that times 3.5, the average family, guess what you get? About a half a million that make up the priesthood group. Then look at the, the bridesmaid, five wise and five foolish. Well, five times, that word five is five times the bride amount. Well, that's roughly uh, two and a half million. Well, you add the bride and the bridegroom, that's about three million. Making it to the place of safety. That's roughly the same amount of what the experts estimate of the exodus of Egypt was two and a half to three million. I don't think it's an accident. I think you're right. And, and unfortunately, I think there's a lot of people that are making presumptions about their qualification. Uh, they're making a lot of presumption about having oil and being prepared. And that's why I asked you point blank where you plan to be. And of course, the answer is Israel. And so yeah. on that note, I'm going to, we're going to wrap. But I, I just... I am so thankful that you're on watch. Uh, and I want to ask a favor now that uh, in the next few weeks, as things tighten up, if you would be so kind as to come back and give us an update uh, so that we can see some of the same things that you're seeing. Because as you know, the landscape continues to change and more things come into view that we didn't know even a month ago. Look, I would be even willing to go over there and give you a presentation to all, all of your people. Because uh, remember, they already got the spiritual knowledge. Now they need to get the knowledge to get them on how the Mekras and all these data points. These stories in the Bible are not random. They're data points where you figure out the last book of the Bible. He says, if you can overcome these obstacles and make it, pray that you make it. And he says only the wise are going to The ones who are careless and sitting on their butt won't make it. Well, there you have it, folks. What he's saying point blank is, this is not a time for sleeping. This is a time for awakening. Thank you, Gil, for taking the time to share with us. May the Lord continue to bless you. May he continue to give you insight and wisdom. And I pray those that listen to this broadcast take to heart the serious hour that we're living in. We've got things on their way to the planet. There are things that are going to affect us in the natural. 
as we saw things coming in the spirit, well, we already know that whatever happens in the spirit will manifest in the natural. And what Gil is talking about is you need to not only understand the things in the spiritual realm, but you need to understand in the natural how these things play out. And I look forward to that presentation. I look forward to you sharing with us how that works and decoding some of these things for us. This is Peter Michael Martinez. I'm on the line with Gil Broussard. And what he has just told us is confirmation of what we've already known, that this is not a year to mess with. This is a year to be prepared. To be Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Sure, you're welcome. Uh, pleasure. Always uh, willing to share the limited knowledge that I have with others that I think reinforces the scripture. Uh, I think people have uh, need to know that there's a lot more factual uh, things in the Bible that gives you uh, a solid base for the uh, rest of it to come around. Amen. And for those of you that are, we're, we're, we are recording, and for those of you that are catching on to this when uh, you're listening to this, this is Gil Broussard, and he's agreed to take some time out of his very busy schedule to talk with us and share the things that he's been led to discover and uncover and share with the world. And many of the things that, again, he's been talking about uh, some of you have run across his material on uh, YouTube. Uh, he's, he's become YouTube famous, as, as my uh, teenage daughter says. Um, and uh, this is a, an extraordinary uh, blessing to our house and to all those that listen uh, concerning the things that are lining up right now uh, to confirm Bible prophecy and to confirm that the ancient scriptures and the recordings of the ancients are not irrelevant but in fact are accurate and foretell many things that we need to be sensitive to. Now as a bit of a backdrop uh, I'm an amateur at this. I, I watch the sky only for new moons and for slivers and uh, uh, you know uh, blood moons and things like that. In fact, October we had October to November we had here on the Sea of Galilee we had a phenomena where we saw the rise of I believe it was five blood moons, uh, if I remember correctly, mm -hmm. um, in late October into uh, the first part of November. So October 30th, 31st, the, the first, the second, and then the sky went overcast. We don't know if that was natural or unnatural, but we couldn't see the moon for two days and then caught it again. So, And it was red every time. And people were asking me, you know, did you did, did you go down to the street? And it was 3 a.m. the last one. You know, of course not. We just took photographs. But, but it really did happen. And we put it out there on the Internet. And, of course, a lot of people saw that. So, so I know for a fact that he uses the signs in the heavens as, uh, or the, the, the celestial bodies as signs. This is what he does. I've talked a lot about this. But without further ado, Gil, I'd like you to just, I know you sent me a PDF file with, a number of different topics that you could touch on and we don't want to be disrespectful to your time at all so please share as much as you can I know that they just came up with the biblical king um, royal seal unearthed in Jerusalem if you want to start there and talk about how that relates to uh, what's on its way um, you, the floor is yours okay uh, to start off with Hezekiah um Remember when the uh, shadow had went backwards uh, in uh, some people's uh, text that it may mention that it was a sundial. Well, the uh, the math and the science doesn't work well with a sun uh, sundial. So we went back to the Hebrew to check, and it says uh, it, the shadow went backwards on steps. And that made a lot more sense because if you face the steps, the... Uh, north and south, you have a tilt of the earth of 26 to 28 degrees, which is uh, proven out in two other incidences uh, in history that I can find that uh, the earth has tilted before of 26 to 28 degrees. 
And uh, what's interesting about Hezekiah's seal, it shows a winged disc, which is common throughout history pertaining to this planet. The wings on the disc, the wings actually means flight or movement in the sky. The disc is representing the planet, sometimes called a sun or an illuminated body in ancient Hebrew, as well as the Greek, uh, helios means illuminated body as well. Sometimes it's misinterpreted in the text as sun, but it, when you bring it back, to, because often the moon is mentioned, so people assume that the other illuminated body is the sun, and but that's an assumption. Because any time you read in the text, when there's a double eclipse, when the moon and sun are darkened, that does not happen in the natural. It takes a third object to darken both both the sun and the moon at the same time. Because let's take, for instance, Yeshua's sacrifice. There was a three-hour darkness, and it was on a full moon. Full moon's on the opposite side of Earth. It takes the moon to make a solar eclipse, which is a new moon. And it can only give you 7.3 to 7.5 minutes of darkness, and that's only a... You can uh, actually see the information and the data that relates to a real model that also the same overlay that the Chinese model has produced is the same overlay on all of these models with the 150-year separate, I mean, the 150-day separation between the entry and exit, and with this object on the planetary plane of Earth. And um, that's what's so shocking about the data. Absolutely. Well, you want to make sure you go ahead and check that out. Now, at the end of the, of the first hour, we started getting into some passages from Scripture. Uh, you know, which make a lot of sense uh, in reference to the previous passes near Earth of uh, of Planet X. Now, could you share some of these um, different uh, times? Uh, and, and and you mentioned several. You mentioned um, you know King Sennacherib, the crucifixion, the uh, the Joshua's long day. King Sennacherib, and I mean, you have so many. The Tower of Babel. Could you uh, you know? Could you talk about some of these and maybe shed some light on you know why do you believe this was uh, based on your research produced uh, by Planet X, the passing of Planet X? Okay. Um, the um, well, if we can go back to the first one, if you want um, Noah's flood, we had uh, touched on the subject that um, it was 150 days between the start of the flood. And when the water started to recede, uh, when a impact from a large meteorite um, hit the Earth, and 91% of our crust uh, was knocked into space uh, from the opposite side, it is because crust at the time and still is crust is only held on by gravity uh, because it's not glued on. That's why we have continental drift. And that went out, and that actually formed our moon. The volume of our moon is exactly what's missing as far as our missing continental crust. Therefore, the water could recede to the, uh, the you see, depression, which are our oceans today. And um, that model, again, proves out without violating any uh, planetary laws. Then the next, next one after that, is uh, the Tower of uh, Babel. And uh, in the Talmud, again, gives us additional historical information on, the, on this event. It says that uh, the top of the tower was burned, the lower part of the tower sank into the sand like liquefaction, just what we would expect. And the burning, I'm assuming that the burning was caused by a meteorite shower on the top. And it says only the center section is left for people to view. Well, if you go on Google Earth and look south of the ancient city of Bag Baghdad, that's actually the 
mid kingdom. If you look farther south than that, that's where the old kingdom used to be during the time of this tower. And you see the outline of a square that is the base of the ancient Zizarat of Tower of Babel. And it has a moat around it, a water moat, because the base has sunken into the sand, leaving it as void to be filled up with water. So the data is checking out on, on this one. Then the next event after that was the time of Joseph of Egypt. Seven days of plenty, seven days of, uh, of drought. Um, remember Joseph's dream where he said that he saw the moon and he saw uh, 12 stars bowing to him? Right. Or, or 11 stars, I think it was, or 12. Uh, I took that as uh, Leo being the... Uh, the sign of uh, 11 with another planet there, mm -hmm. giving it a 12, okay? And he saw these things bowing to him. They moved, okay? We always thought that that was just, just a dream that never came, per se, true, that it only represented the actual descendants, his son, which it can be interpreted. But with the Niebuhr disc, I can prove that the skies did bow to him because Earth tilted. And when you're looking at the sky from the viewpoint of Earth, that's what it appears, that the moon and the stars bowed to him. Wow, that's pretty interesting. And this is actually the first place that the moon is mentioned in the Hebrew Torah, not in the English translations. Right. Because many of the English translations, they have Moed mistranslated as moon. Moed means appointed time, not mm -hmm. moon. Mm, so wow. this is the actual place where moon is actually listed in Genesis 37, 9. It actually uses the word moon there in, in the Hebrew. And so between the data of the Niebuhr disc and this, uh, we can piece the actual date and the, and the year and the event. And the date was 1794, April 6. That's what the astronomy software can point us to. And well, you know, it, it, when you know this this facts that you're sharing with us tonight, and then, and then you read the Bible again, it 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 just comes alive. It just you look at it from yes, a it totally does. different perspective. Yes, it does. And and during the same time, now Egypt's territory went all the way up to the southern area of what we call today Turkey. Okay, it followed the coastline through uh, Israel all the way to the southern regions of Turkey or Lebanon and Syria and all of that. That was uh, their, um, at that time, they ruled that the markets in, in those areas. Job was around that area. He was uh, around, you see, Damascus area, around the uh, Golan Heights, because that's where his son settled, okay? If you read the story of Job, Job's trouble starts with a meteorite shower where his flock and his shepherds are destroyed. And the house that his uh, children was in collapsed, killing all his children. Right. This was That's caused true. by this, us going through the tail of, of the debris of this planet. Okay? Now, it may have been further away that Earth didn't tilt. Right? Uh, well, no, this is at the same time. I'm sorry. This is the same year and the same time frame as Joseph. That's uh, we we can piece this together in the story, and uh, you, you see what's interesting is uh, you can look at how far Earth travels in one hour. Earth travels eight point four eight point four Earth diameters in one hour in its orbital path. That's how fast Earth is moving. If you take the angle of uh, March 26 on its approach to Earth's path of this orbit during that time, you come up with 52.5 degrees. Now, what's interesting, my, before I had an actual date for this next event, 
I was going with an average. I just took it in the middle of the month, and it gave me closer to 40, 40 degrees. And that's how I came up with uh, that I would, it was roughly uh, seven times the diameter of Earth. But with the date given in Revelation 12.1, it was the actual date using astronomy. Guess what this calculates to now? 6.66 diameters oh. of Earth. <laughs> Incredible. With the actual date that's given in Revelation 12.1. Now, mm. we'll, we'll touch more on that later. Now, after, after uh, Job's trouble comes uh, Joshua's long day. Right. Okay. And uh, Joshua's long day was roughly uh, 355 years later, somewhere around, around there, around 14, uh, in the 1400. B.C. time uh, time period. Well, if you read the story of of, uh, of what took place, the Earth slowed down to give him 12 hours longer daylight so he can finish out finish off his enemy. Now, God told him the previous day to uh, go and conquer his enemy. That's Ten times larger than him. He only had 30,000. The army was 300,000. And he said, don't worry, I will deliver them to you. Okay. He gets there in the morning. The, the army is frightened because the sun is delayed coming up. And he comes in charging and they're, they're, they start to run. And he starts to slaughter them. Then a meteorite shower comes within the sight of his men and uh, Joshua and annihilate more of the enemy than he did with sword. Now, how accurate can a person be with a meteorite shower where you're in view of it and it's only your enemy that is being wiped out? Mark Rock. And tell you ahead of time that this is going to happen. Well, and the Lord is able Earth, to direct those rocks, isn't he? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And he can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. He's the only one that's able to tell time, you know, the future. And Earth traveled through the magnetosphere of this planet, and that's what caused the rotational delay of 4.5 to 5.5% per hour compounded hourly, and you get the Earth to stop, as it claims. The, the, uh, the model proves this out. Then um, the I think the um, Talmud says the meteorite shower happened between two to three hours later. Well, I have a um, a chart that shows how far Earth travels in two to three hours if this object passed roughly half the distance between the moon, and this exactly calculates correctly for the beginning and the start of a meteorite shower. Now, could this also have caused uh, what happened in Sodom and Gomorrah? Because we know that there was definitely a, uh, a, a, a rock or some type of a huge explosion that just wiped out that whole uh, area there, uh, not just Sodom and Gomorrah, but also other cities that are mentioned in the Bible. Was this also a result of... Uh, of the of the passing nearby of this celestial object at that time. Uh, now this is where the data gets a little sketchy. Uh, my personal opinion, I believe it to be true. But there's a little bit of a conflict between the age of Abraham and when it, and I'm finding out that uh, if we go with the astronomical date. I, I believe that I can fit this in where Solomon and Mr. Gomorrah was at the same time as the Tower of Babel, but just in a different area. Tower of Babel was in uh, Iraq. Solomon and Mr. Gomorrah was at the southern end of the Dead Sea, both being hit by meteorite showers at the same time. You see? And... Uh, we know that Abraham left uh, Babylon 
and traveled somewhere in Israel because he was fairly near uh, Solomon and Ms. Gomorrah to be able to rescue Lot. Remember how Lot, and it's when, uh, he was warned by the angel to go over I, the mountain, mm-hmm. that it was not safe in the valley. And That's he right. told him not to look back. His wife, okay, there was two cities, not one. There was two that were destroyed. So when they got to the point where they were over the mountain, the first city goes up. The Lot's wife hears the explosion. So she turns around and goes around where she was protected and shielded from the rock. You know, the rock was shielding her from the blast. She went around the rock, and at the same time, the second city was detonated, was going off. Any super large explosion like a meteorite, if you're close enough, you're vaporized. Just like it would be an atomic explosion, but it wasn't an atomic explosion, but it's like an atomic. She was vaporized. Right. Now, if you take a look at what happened in Nagasaki, there's people's shadows that are still there today mm. on the cement oh. wall where they used to stay because they were vaporized. This is what happened to Lot's wife. Her shadow was the only thing left. And the way that they wrote it, remember, it doesn't say God turned it to, uh, to a pill of salt. It's the observers that are writing on what they saw. She was turned to because they could see the perfect outline of her. Of her. Right. She was right. turned to because they had no explanation at the time. They didn't have a word like vaporization. They didn't even know what happened to her. They just saw the only thing left was a shadow, and that was probably her right there. Okay? That's how it's explained in the Bible, because you have to separate what God said happened and what the observer is witnessing. Now, They're only think, using the words uh, that they have. Do you think, Gil, that these ancient civilizations uh, that built the pyramids, the built of the Sphinx, which, of course, you know, it's, it's pointing towards the belt of Orion. You know, it's, it's Orion's belt and um, the Sphinx, basically, uh, the, the, you, know, the face, you know, the body of a lion and the face of a, of, of a virgin, Virgo. Uh, is this in somehow depicting or related to uh, this object, the trajectory of this object, where it comes from, and how you know how it comes in and out, and affects our our celestial, uh, you know, our our galaxy, our our solar, you know, system. Uh, could this be maybe a warning sign, or maybe a, something that they used to kind of foretell uh, how far uh, this object was, uh, you know, uh, from you know how far okay. away or how close it was? Let me give you some. The planetary science version, okay? Mm-hmm. Once an object is in motion in space, its orbit, it's going to be stationary. It's going to always come in and out at the points of reference. Passover and the end of August. That's its entry and exit point. The third point is locked in at the sun. Things are pivoting. If it has a magnetic field, it's pivoting around the sun. Okay, so you have three fixed points now. That locks it in on Earth's orbital orbital plane, okay? Straight off the bat, we cannot be 4.6 billion years old with a planet that's playing Russian roulette coming through here every 300-something years. The odds of that, we would have been already annihilated. We have to be a young Earth in a young universe because the odds are against us on being old. It's right. impossible. Secondly, the constellation, you see, Orion is over 90 degrees away from viewing this entry point. Okay? You won't be able to see it matching up with Orion as if Earth was in the position prior to Passover, like uh, maybe... Uh, January, February, looking at the daytime sky when this object is coming around the sun, then you could line up the two. Now, keep in mind, you won't be able to see Mr. Orion because it's the daytime sky. You'd have to do your, you know, you'd have to be a trained astronomer or someone who knows stars to be able to know that it's there. Okay? Mm -hmm. But that's about the only way that it can line up. 
see, the pyramids can't be as old as they say it is neither because they're assuming the progression of the Earth's uh, tilt because it goes, the tilt of the Earth would make a total circle, something like 26,000 years. And they assume that that is a constant, and it's not. Uh, we were thrown off by over two months uh, during Noah's Noah's flood. Because mm -hmm. uh, when this thing came in, it says it was the second month. And the raid that the Hebrews held the month, is, it was in time with the harvest of a crop. That means your seasons were earlier. The orbit of the planet did not change. It still came in what we call today... Uh, the month of uh, March was still the month of March then. But the, the way Hebrew was telling time between the time of harvest gave him the time of Passover. And his seasons were earlier. The only way you can have that is the tilt of the earth was changed. And now it's later. Now it matches up what it is today. Passover right. and March are... are are in line, and that's because the tilt of the earth changed. And we can see this. I can prove several times where earth has changed, the continents have sw sw switched, and because uh, it it will cause these things to be awesome. It's, 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 it's not a constant. Therefore, when you try to line up the pyramids with the stars of Orion, you have to back up the software so many thousands of years to be able to make this work they say the pyramids are older than Egyptians uh, by, what, uh, several thousand years or something like that to make, to make the lineup happen. But that's only if you use it as a constant that the progression is the, always the same. It wasn't. This object has disturbed that. So we don't know the real time that this lines up. Right. You see? It, 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 sure, it lined up with Monsieur Ryan. But we cannot say that it's X amount of thousand years earlier when it was built. We can't, we can't pinpoint the time the pyramids were built using the stars at that time. Cannot do it. Cannot so do it. basically, uh, Gil, uh, based on the, all the previous passages of this object, uh, it, it, it's, it's like you said, it's like a Russian roulette. It's like a, sh it's, it's like a shooting gallery. Uh, uh, it, 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 it is all about uh, location, location, and location. Where is the Earth yes. in relation to this object when it comes by? So apparently this last passages that you know we talked about uh, in relation to the Bible stories, the Earth was not that close when it came by. Uh, and there were some consequences, some uh, asteroids, meteors hitting the Earth and so forth, you know, and some tilting of the Earth, but nothing really catastrophic that destroyed life like in the days of Noah. Now, there was a lot of talk during, the, of course, 2012 and 2013 about the Mayan calendar. Uh, I personally never thought there was going to happen anything uh, at that time. Uh, the Lord didn't show me anything. I didn't feel anything. But could could maybe the Mayans, could could they maybe have plotted this thing scientifically? like by researching and doing all this research and found out that the next time that this object came by, it was going to be different, and, and they marked it as the end of this Mayan calendar. I mean, I, I don't have anything to go by here except right. God feeling, but have you, you know, have you thought about this? Have you researched this? Have you, uh, you know, uh, formulated any kind of theory about this? I have a theory that I don't have time to prove out thoroughly. Okay, so this is so I'm just going to say this in, mm -hmm. in as a general statement, not a factual statement of any kind. Sure. Because I cannot prove it right now. I don't have the time. But if you take a look and examine the Mayan calendar and look at the outer rim, you see that it's representing a comet-like object mm -hmm. multiple times. It's like Oh, uh, let me see, one, two, three. About 20 times or so, it's represented on the outer rim. This calendar is an event calendar, not a, um, uh, 
a yearly calendar or a civilization. It's an event calendar of every time this object came around. Remember how they have a long count and a short count? Right. Okay. Like a tones, yeah. They got other counts also that they're not telling us about that I've, that I've looked out. And they can't make them fit, so they only brought to our attention the long and short count. But that's not what it's referring to. It's referring to how many days between the event, which you can calculate in years, each event that this object came by. In other words, if you take what's a Bakhtun, if you look up the actual Bakhtun, it's 394.26 years. Guess what? That adds up to it. Exactly when Constantine, remember we have a date when he, bat, he had the battle? Right. Uh, in uh, 112 A.D.? Well, we know the Mayans had a severe drought and almost uh, about 90% of the population died around the 700s. Well, if you calculate forward into time, the one Bakhtun, you get 707. That's exactly when the archaeologists saying they had the major drought. That's when this thing passed. Each unit of measure is the span of time between events. Wow. The Mayan calendar is, my theory is that it's an event calendar documenting the span of time between each event. And that's why there's multiple periods of time that they're logging. It's been over overlooked. So that so, in, so in other words what you're saying, Gil, it's a very interesting thing because I had never, you know, thought about it that way or connected it, but the 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 back tombs actually could be maybe like um they said, you know, the time for each celestial event, or you know, roughly kind yeah. of a, a, if you will, a, a measuring stick that they had, uh, like you said, not a, a timeline, but like an event uh, calendar, basically stating, you know, when these things were going to happen, and for some reason, their calendar just abruptly ends in the twenty twelve. That's 24. the theory. Yeah. That is a theory. Right now I have not been able to prove that because I only got one or two um uh, counts from them. And unless I read the original data, because reading the Mayan counting system is quite easy. It's not that difficult. And if I could go back that's why that I think they have to remake their calendar every three hundred and sixty years and add another event to the outer to the outer perimeter. Okay? Mm. And uh, and so it's a misunderstanding. We have that often when reading ancient objects. We go with an assumption, okay, it's a calendar, now let's make it work for a yearly thing. What are they trying? No, it's an event calendar. Totally different. They were fascinated when this object's coming by because of the earthquakes, the droughts, the severity of it. They wanted to know to where they could prepare grain and water ahead of time, just like we would. I have a question here from the chat room, uh, Gil, that I'm going to ask you. Uh, it says, uh, if the if you know if the cornfield crops, the uh, you know that design that was made, uh, the astral art, aligns with Planet X, uh, have you seen that or have you uh, looked into that? Well, let me give you some information that's hard numbers. Okay, that's hard mm -hmm. to you can't dispute on where the object is at. It's going to be pointing, it's going to come out of the, the constellation Sagittarius, okay? We have, this is where the Vorgen Pioneer probes, are, look, there's 12 constellations on a planetary plane. Even if you would divide it in the vertical, another 12, what are the odds of it being the same constellation? Very high, very high. So you got Voyager and Pioneer that went to that constellation. You got the biblical data that's pointing to that constellation. You got the Chinese data that's pointing to that constellation. You got the UL study that new gravity is affecting the orbits of comet in that exact region of space. Confirmed by a London astronomer that confirmed these same findings of comets that is affected in that same space. You got five studies that point to the same. We got hard data here. Not, yeah. you know, look, you can take clay tablets, you can take papyrus uh, scrolls, you can take uh, any type of data 
If you can bring it into a laboratory and reproduce it as a model, show that it's repeatable, that's science. I'm sorry, but the the way the uh, the way they interpreted the Sumerian text cannot be produced a proper model that matches history. The 3,600 year orbit and coming out from some other does not match the repeated data throughout history. Larry, Without do you have the a question Chinese for data, Gil? we could not verify this. Huh? Uh, well, Larry, that? do you have a question for for uh, for our guest? Yeah, I find that very very interesting, and I wanted to. Uh, I just saw a new post this morning that's very interesting. Let me read this real quick because it kind of goes along with a little bit of what he's saying. Um, I got up this off of the Quill Alerts. It says that there's an alert that came out from the Inuit elders uh, regarding Earth's wobble, and they're reporting their sky has changed. And this is uh, well, they also uh, coordinated that with NASA. They say this is what the Inuit, Inuits are saying that their sun doesn't rise where it used to, and their sun is higher in the sky, and their days are longer, and they're finding animal life. Uh, with burns and uh, on their bodies and dead animals, and also the sun, the stars, and the moon have changed where they are in the sky. Uh, that's the first I've heard of this, and I'm not able to confirm it. Now, I do know that if I put my telescope up and point it to the North Star, everything is still showing correctly, that the data that's in the telescope is matching uh you know like in other words if earth tilted and it was not you know the 24 degrees tilt, whatever uh then we would have a problem and you'd see it in a telescope uh uh in uh setting up a telescope and uh i i'm uh, i'm thinking that they you know, I'd have to look into it further. I don't have, I can't answer you properly on that, except that okay, just, I haven't found yeah, just, anything yet. Okay, just one more question. Uh, Augusto brought up Hercobulus by B. M. Rubelu, and also, uh, you know, he called it the Red Planet. Are you aware of the uh, the Coburn, so-called Coburn Bible, and uh, or the Coburn ancient books? That report about sure. uh, not only not only a planet, in other words, another planet, but also an entourage of a dead star. Uh, do you know anything See, about that, or are you just uh, yeah. talking about Planet X? Well, uh, the, that's why I called it Planet Seven uh, X, is to separate the data, because the Chinese model makes no mention of additional orbiting planets. And if you look at the Bible, if we had an object that came between the Earth and the moon and that the universe is ruled by electromagnetic, not gravity, uh, I think that they would document it that it had other orbital... I think it's a misunderstanding of meteorites, mm -hmm. okay, or debris following it, but not actually moons, per se. Um, because, uh, but time would tell, but I'm just saying my data does not document, there's nothing in the data that I found that proves that out. Therefore, I okay. can't say it. Sure. What about a, uh, binary, uh, solar, you know, in other words, our star also having a so-called twin, a binary uh, sure. universe? Uh, that's another uh, thing that doesn't prove out. Our closest star is 4.5 light years away. All right? If it needed another star to rotate, which you'd have to have an orbit way beyond 3,600 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, m hundreds of times larger, probably. And this object is proving out, look, the last time we saw it was in 1054 with the data from the Chinese. It was seen before that, but it was, uh, but not, uh, it seemed like it's been censored during the dark, uh, uh, dark ages and when the, uh, the Vatican had extreme power and people had their own concerns on just trying to live, 
during the plagues and the drought that they've had during those time periods. If you read the stories, it's very horrific time. It's a bad time, yeah. And, uh, right. So documenting this object in the was not exactly a priority to them. And if it was, it would have probably been labeled as heresy, and they would have been confiscated, or you would have been hung, uh, even trying to document this thing. It's a, it's a very strange period of time. So, uh, but we do have occasion. Uh, uh, we do have some plaques, or carvings, or paintings representing a couple of sightings. And what's interesting, uh, they'll say this is Halley's, because they'll show two comets in the sky. Well, they also show data in the in the painting of meteorite showers bombarding a town. Where buildings are coming, you can see the earth is shifting. You see trees are down. You see people are holding their stomach from sickness, whether it's drought or starvation or illness or what, or gas. It could be, you know, some sort of gas that comes out the ground. Uh, that's not done by Halley's Comet. There is no documentation of, because Halley's Comet, his orbit does not intersect Earth's planetary plane. Therefore, its debris cannot collide with Earth. It's impossible. Well, let me let me bring up another really weird one here. You know where in the Bible it talks about uh, the moon does not keep its place. In other words, it leaves its place of where it's supposed to be. Uh, could this object uh, somehow influence that that event in the future? Are you talking about Joel, where Joel uh-huh. says? Yeah. Let me uh, yeah. let me read it. Let me find it real real quick here. Oh no! Let's see. I think uh, I believe in Isaiah it talks about it too. Okay. Well, there's one that's very very common, and um, let's see here. Well. Joel, Joel says, I'm going to just paraphrase it. I don't have it in front of me. Sure. Joel states that uh, he will make, the sun will go down at noon. And he'll take what's normally called a day of brightness, dark. We used to assume that used to be an eclipse, but that's not what it's describing now. Because he would have stated that he would have darkened the sun. He didn't say he darkened the sun. He said he made the sun go down early by six hours or more. Mm-hmm. That's now, the rotation Isaiah, of the earth. Now, in, now I, I think I found a scripture here that I think is what Larry is referring to in Isaiah 24, okay. 20, Isaiah 24, 23 says, Then the moon shall be confounded, Yeah, yeah. and the sun shall be ashamed. And the, and uh-huh. then there's others where it says the moon shall be as the light of the sun. You know, in other words, the moon is going to intensify in 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 light. And in Isaiah thirteen ten, he talks about the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Okay. So, so obviously there's going to be a lot of uh, impact on the moon as far as you know. Uh, it, it, it's going to, it's going to act weird. Uh, I, I guess that's what well, you're trying to ask, Larry, right? That, that's it. Yeah, yeah that, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well. Let me give you the, the, the planetary physics version on this, okay? You can only have a new moon create an eclipse of the sun. And that's when, if you look at a new moon, it's totally black in the sky. So if they're referring to both of these objects having an eclipse, it has to be a third object. Because the moon has to be away from it, from its new moon position, whether it's in full moon or, you know, a quarter of that or whatever, it has to be away from its new moon for you to even see a difference in the moon, for it to be eclipsed in reddish color, and for the sun to be eclipsed. You're talking about a third object. This is the same thing that took place during Yeshua, uh, sacrifice. Remember the three hours of ecl- uh, that they state? that there was the eclipse for three hours, Mm -hmm. the sun and the moon went dark. Well, we have a problem here. (laughs) (laughs) Passover was on a a full moon. 
therefore the moon cannot be involved with the solar eclipse. It's the opposite side of Earth. It has so to be on the inside. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And a moon can only give you 7.3 hours, uh, 7.3 minutes of a solar eclipse, maximum. And it does not darken the whole Earth as the text refers to. It only darkens a small path, and Earth rotates out of the shadow. That's why it can only last 7.3 minutes. Hmm. So if you have an object, what I'm saying is seven times the diameter of the Earth, or six and a half, somewhere in there, at a given distance, it will give you exactly three hours of darkness over the entire Earth, and also eclipse the moon at the same time. It is referring to a third object right here. This is the same object that Yeshua said, the sign of Jonah. When Jonah went to Nineveh and warned him. Right. Yeah, that's that's that that, that makes a whole lot of sense. More sense now than than you know w once you know this detail. Well, we got about twelve minutes left, and I have a. A question, a couple of questions that I'm going to ask, and I know a lot of people out there are are asking the same question, and and you have done a tremendous amount of research on this, uh, uh, Gil, and and that is, how bad will this next pass be based on your on your research and what you have observed, and secondly, uh, how close is this event? Well. Uh in short, I do not have a crystal ball. I cannot predict the future or even attempt in a way of saying unless I have data. And that data has to come from someone who can predict the future. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I look for data. In Revelation, it says, uh, Revelation 12.1, uh, it says, the moon at the foot of a woman that with a crown of 12 stars. Well, if you say stars and you say moon, where are we looking at? Looking in the heavens and the stars. Mm -hmm. What woman is in it? Virgo. Okay? Mm -hmm. when, I, when I read that uh, through astronomy eyes, I immediately spotted it as being Virgo. With a crown of 12 stars, is, Leo is 11 stars. But Jupiter comes across that, that path, which is called the king planet. The same king planet which, which notified the Magi that the Messiah was born. Okay? Mm -hmm. It was over, the, over Regus, and that gave an a, a announcement. They had the king planet with the king star. Regus is about where the heart of the, uh, Leo is, the lion. So when you bring Jupiter back into the play, it gives you 12 stars of the crown over Virgo, the moon at her feet, and the next it says, it's closed with the sun. Now, Revelation is the only book that we do not have a Hebrew or Aramaic version to confirm our text that is being used. But throughout the rest of the Bible, it has proven out that often, not all the time, but often, the word in Hebrew was illuminated body, not sun. The Greeks who are sun worshipers would automatically put sun there because he's trying to fill in the blanks. Okay? That word does not represent sun. It represents a illuminated body. And how do we know this? Two, the repeat pattern is Passover. Okay? You can only see Passover in the nighttime skies. Okay. You have to be in September to see it in the daytime sky. Okay? Mm -hmm. The zodiac, which is again, it's 180 degrees opposite of anything in the Bible, uses the daytime skies. We shouldn't be using that, for one. It's not the pattern set in the Bible. Daniel and them use the nighttime skies. And uh, two, you cannot see stars during the day. You have to use charts or software and use it as if you were reading a zodiac. Okay? Anyone can see the sign that I'm talking about in nighttime 
in the month of Passover at night, Leo is smack dab in the center of the uh, nighttime skies at midnight. If you switch this object, this illuminated body, this planet X coming through here, its tail, the the just like a comet, the tail is pointing opposite of the sun, and guess what? It goes right through Virgo, the tail, illuminating Virgo only, as the text refers. The sun illuminates all the constellations, not just one. But the tail of this object in the model only illuminates Virgo. Only an object on a planetary plane of Earth can illuminate Virgo. Okay. So this gives us the date that this object is going to cross Earth path, and that's March 26 of 2016 has given us a date. Now, from a model, I can put this in there, and using the 150-day separation, it tells me it enters at uh, the end of August. It enters our inner solar system, rounds the sun, and exits out on March 26, where we're about two hours uh, behind it for it to be in between the moon and the earth, that means it's passing, and about two hours later, we're entering the let me see, debris field of its tail, which is seal six in Revelation. The first meteorite shower is seal six. The 150 days later is seal seven. Seal seven, now visually, the seal six is going to be more of an impact visually. With the tilting of the Earth, the you see aurora boreas coming down to the equator, with the meteorite shower hitting one third of the, uh, burning one third of the trees, one third of the grass, and later it says one third of the rivers. It is describing continental crust, and we know that only half of the Earth is hit from meteorites coming from the sunny side, on the side that the sun is on. So what half of the Earth is one-third of the continental crust? North and South America. Exactly. Asia and Europe is two-thirds of the continental crust. The Bible is telling us what half of the Earth is going to be hit by meteorite after a 12-hour delay in its rotation. The delay is the false miracle that the Antichrist is going to perform in front of people that even make, that even the elite of his uh, of followers of will be in doubt, you know will uh, will be a uh, amazed mm. because he will predict a twelve hour rotation of Earth and that fire will fall on his enemies, which is North and South America. This Antichrist is going to be probably the Mahdi of Islam, right. For him to be recognized as the Mahdi of Islam, he has to be a world leader for seven years prior to be identified as a Mahdi. And he has to have a sign in the heaven that proclaims him. Mm. This sign is this object. His false miracle is the rotation of the earth by 12 hours. In other words, scientists will predict that the meteorite shower will hit the Middle East and Europe. After a 12-hour delay in its rotation, it doesn't. It hits North and South America. And this is the false miracle that this Mahdi performs. Uh, telling the Muslims that they're okay and safe because they can't leave their country because no one's going to grant them a visa. Because prior to that, in CO4, it talks about a war in the Middle East and terrorist activity and famine and uh, disease. The Muslim, when when... Israel attacks Iran, you're going to have terrorist activity in all Western countries going on because of the Muslims. So mm. this is right here. When they ask for visas to leave the danger zone, everybody refuses them. So they feel trapped. Then the Mahdi comes in there and says, look, don't worry. I will change times and laws. I will change the rotation alert by 12 hours, and I'll have it rain fire on our enemies. So basically what you're saying, Gil, is that 
this individual, in order to be accepted as the Mahadi, has had to be in power already for seven years uh, somewhere in the world, correct? According to the Islamic, uh, remember, this, this guy has to fulfill Christianity, which is the Antichrist form of it, mm-hmm. uh, you know, that he has to... He has to form Judaism as a form of a prophet of some form, or, you know, and he has, to form, he has to fulfill Islam. For him to be a fool, the world, he has to do all of this. Islam says he has to be a world leader for seven years prior to even showing up and claiming to be anything, and he has to bring peace to the Middle East. That's his first accomplishment after that. Through a peace then treaty, from is, there, it, it, yeah, through a peace treaty, which is come, all through the Bible. That's seal five. If you read seal five, where the, the souls from underneath the altar are complaining to the Father, why have you not revenged? And he says, go back to sleep. It's not your time. And the reason why they it used to bother me, why are the souls complaining to God? It's because they see on earth a peace agreement being signed, and they've, they have not been revenged yet. Hmm. It's the peace agreement that woke him up. Where's our uh, pound of flesh? When are you going to miss revenge? He says, go back to sleep. It's not your time. So needless to say, we are in for some pretty turbulent times in, in, in this next several uh, months and years, which is kind of interesting, and, and it's a shame we don't have time to get into it, but that is pretty in line, uh, uh, Gil, with what the uh, Great Seal of, of of the United States really, uh, uh, you know, says. In that pyramid with uh, the thirteen layers. I mean, uh, it, it's it's incredible how all these things are coming together, and they all point to that year, uh, 2016. Uh, Isaac Isaac Newton also prophesied it. Uh, Jonathan Edwards, many many men that studied the Bible and. And were shown, uh, you know, visions. They, they spoke of that year uh, as the year when this whole thing was going to be wrapped up, or at least be, uh, it was going to begin to be wrapped up. And so, this has been a tremendously interesting program, exciting program. Uh, we're going to have to have you back and talk some more about this. Uh, would you give out once again your your contact information for those listeners out there that want to contact you and maybe take a look at all this? Uh, uh, data that you have uh, researched? Sure. All of the data and the charts I give freely. And if they go to my YouTube channel and uh, they can click on any video, uh, just type in Planet 7X or type in my name and it will bring you to the site. Underneath the video in the About section, you have to click and it opens up. There's a link to a drop Dropbox. And um, it will link you to all the data, the charts, um, all of the data that are formulated to where you can do your own study and your own reasoning. Remember, the Bible says, have an ear and listen to anybody, but prove it out into the Scripture. And that's what I'm pointing out. Uh, well, and, I, and I give the Scripture sections. In it. Now, to give you a, a little bit of uh, more information quickly, Remember well, how I told you? In, well, our oh, time is up, Gil. Uh, time is up? Okay. <laughs> our Maybe time on, is next, up. on the next program. On okay. the next program, we'll pick it up. But uh, it has been an exciting program, and we are we are very thankful you, uh, you took the time to join us. So God bless you. And um, Larry, thank you for joining us. And uh, everyone listening out there, this is Augusto Perez with the Appearance Portal saying shalom, shalom. God bless you. Bye-bye.
Hi, everybody. This is Steve Olson and my great co-host, Bad Baby. Hi, Bad Baby. Hi, Steve. It's a pleasure to be here again tonight with and two we of my favorite special... fellas. Yeah, well, you wanted to introduce our special guest tonight, uh, Bad Baby. Oh, tonight we have Gil Bizarre with us. And, and like I said, you guys are two of my special fellas. Aw. So welcome to the show, Gil. Thank you for coming on. Well, thank you for having me. Well, Gil, we, we actually, this happens every time that I have somebody on. We started the show before we got on here, guys. We already started talking about, um, you know, what we were thinking. But Gil, maybe a good place to start is just to talk a little bit through, you know, a little bit your, about your ministry and what you do, but mostly just kind of introduce people to the whole big picture of how this all came to be in the public knowledge and where people like you do research on it. Well, the way that I came into this was uh, being a skeptic. Um, I had friends of mine ask whether or not uh, Planet X was real and whether or not it was biblical. And I, I gave a like an off, off the cuff answer that I didn't believe it was real and it probably wouldn't have any evidence to support such a claim. Um, and so I decided to do a search and most of the stuff on the internet could be recognized as not being sound scientific research or wasn't sound in its math or violated uh, principles of astronomy, like Kepler's laws of planetary motion, uh, sizes equivalent to an orbit of 3,600 years and so on and so on. There's multiple points that you can point out that does not meet the physics, which are commonly stated on the internet. So I was, uh, but one thing that caught my attention was the catastrophes that happened throughout history. That seemed factual based because there was eyewitness accounts, but we, we didn't have a cause for these, you know, so I, uh, I decided to check the Asian records because the Asian records in their astronomy goes back about uh, about four, four to six thousand, well, between four to five thousand years. And, and to my surprise, in 1054, they uh, documented an object that was only about 960 years ago without a telescope, telescopes were not misinvented yet. The Asian astronomers of China, Korea, and Japan uh, documented an object for 26 months, 13 months coming in, 13 months leaving. And this was only by eye, uh, uh, witness accounts, you know, just from visual. That means you have to have an extremely large object reflecting light for that period of time. And they gave it so accurate we could plot an orbit, which is a standard elliptical orbit, okay? Uh, it doesn't have a, 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 like a helical type orbit, like if it was a mini solar set. This had just a standard straight elliptical or orbit, like what you would expect for like a planet or a, a comet or anything similar to that. And when we put it into the software and put what the minimum amount that they could see by eye and set that at the 13 months out and, and put it along this path, this roughly gives us an estimate of a size between five to seven times the diameter of Earth. And that white paper report, which is not, you know, this is a scientific white, uh, white paper from the Dublin Institute of Advanced Studies, this caught my attention, that it was sound, it's reproducible, and that's what science is. It did not violate, it followed all known um, laws of astronomy at the time. And that's when I knew that we have a real object. And then when you go back with this chart you see right here, and you go back and track the history of when they were looking for this planet throughout history, you have a timeline. 
that in 1992, NASA pretty much went silent on the whole object, uh, the whole subject. And whenever you do an overlay on where they sent the Pioneer Voyager probes, well, this was the exact same area of space that the Asian astronomers witnessed this object coming in from. That's Sagittarius. So this object, when it returns, will be coming from that same point. This is without a doubt. This is, we don't know when, what year, but it, and we can estimate the months because of the past, we have numerous past events where it says that it crosses the Earth's path around Passover. And this next time it comes around would be very similar to one of the, uh, the near passes. It had, a, it had about, oh, about five or six near passes to Earth. Three of those, three degrees. And the book of Revelation clearly states that this next time this object passes, it will be the worst time in all of Earth's history. So that is a close call, a close passing for it to, for it to occur. And there's another, there's many parts to the details with their text that, like it says, the four angels are sent to stop the winds. Well, how do you stop the wind on Earth? Well, the winds are created by the rotation of Earth. Earth's rotation will stop like it did in Joshua's long day. And we have a model that proves that out. That Earth did stop using, if this object like a comet and Earth goes through the tail of a comet is plasma, not ice particles. And that we start to slow down four and a half to five and a half percent compounded hourly for a total of three days where we come to a complete stop. And, this will happen again. Gil, is that is that going to be like in reference to the the days of darkness in the Bible? Well, once we get into the tail, remember the tail is opposite of the sun. So you have either at one point a partial eclipse, and when we in the center of it, we will have a total eclipse. You could have three days of darkness, but it's not similar to total blackness because you're going to have the northern and southern lights come down all the way down to the equator. Your northern lights and southern lights are caused by plasma hitting our hitting our magnetic field. Well, the tail of this comet is plasma, and it's going to be hitting Earth in a very concentrated form. So the northern lights will be extremely intense in the southern lights, and there'll be so much of it, it'll come down all the way down to the equator. And it'll howl like a trumpet, very similar to what the Bible says. Uh, there's too many details in the Bible that are scientifically correct that I cannot, that a model proves out. That right. is uh, beyond, beyond coincidence. Well, again, I go back to the, you were the first researcher that I had ever heard that actually went to the, you know, kind of the more the Asian, um, uh, the, you know, Asian continent for information. And, you know, I kind of always went back and forth on this, right, as I researched, it's like this 3,600 year orbit is, is, you know, kind of pushed in the Sumer, you know, from the um, Stitian perspective. And that seems to be the only thing that it's rooted in, because I can't find anything that says, it's definitely a 10,000, you know what I mean? I, I, there's not enough data to say that. You're the first one to came, that came and said, well, no, I found data. And could you tell us that story a little bit, Gil, about your story of going through and, and finding that information through the, you know, kind of the Asian records again? Right, I, uh, I did a search on, um, you know, comments and uh, studies pertaining to the astronomy uh, of uh, the Asian records. And there's numerous white paper reports. But the one that caught my eye was when it was a reevaluation of Eastern and Western records of the supernova 1054. Well, when I read the, uh, the first, the summary, basically it was telling us that the supernova was a few months earlier and that the main body 
of this sighting was not a supernova because it moved through multiple constellations. A supernova is stationary. And they saw this object for 26 months moving through multiple constellations. What is it? To view something, and then once you, they, they such accurate information on the angle, the, the nearness, how close it was to a, a certain known star, uh, the day, the time of day, the, you name it, all the information we needed. And I, I decided to plot the information. And when I finished plotting this, I think I was the first one to do it, I came out with a very shocking result. We had roughly about 150 to 152 day separation between entry and exit. And that brought to mind Noah's flood, 150 days. It brought to mind Revelation, where it says from the meteor shower CO6 to the meteor shower CO7, it says that they'll suffer for five months before death comes. Well, five months is 150 to 152 days. There is a direct correlation. Wow. And then I say, well, how many times has it passed? Because that wasn't, remember, the, the Asian records only 960 years ago. So how often has it passed? So I have to go back through history. It passes even more frequently than what we're saying here. Yes, it, uh, it passed roughly around every 360 years or so. Depends if it bumps into anything or, you know, collides with something. Remember the asteroid belt that's between Mars and Jupiter? Right. Well, we have known formulas for the position of the planets that tells us the spacing that the planets are. Well, right there in that dead zone where the asteroid belt is, there's supposed to be a planet, according to the calculations. That, that is the remnant of a destroyed planet. Now, the question, the question that begs to be asked is, what destroyed it? A planet just doesn't blow up on its own. There's a cause and effect. That's what science is. Well, this planet, this rogue planet, can answer many of the anomalies we see in our universe. Why is there a scarred Mars? Why is Pluto such a, a strange tilted orbit, like something bumped it, because they think it was part of Neptune. It was a moon off of Neptune. Well, moon just doesn't get extra energy and move on its, on its own. That breaks one of the laws of thermodynamics. But, uh, everything in the universe is losing energy, not gaining. Well, that's, that's been one of my frustrations with this whole thing when I see charts like this. Could you take a minute, Gil, and, you know, this is, this is I think, your best um, estimate as to the, so this is your chart, right? I, I borrowed this chart from uh, uh, the uh, articles on in it, on what's talked about Planet Nine, where yep. they're looking for it. Yep. So could you explain, because a lot of people don't understand, uh, why do I have circles going off to the left and to the right? I think it would be helpful for people, because we this this gets shown a lot. And it would be great to hear you uh, give us a, an overview on it. Just recently, I read three uh, uh, white paper reports on Planet Nine, on where they think it is, uh, the proposed orbit, the direction, and such. They get a little technical. Uh, and even one of them stated that, uh, that remember, in on the universe, things are mag... Uh, magnetic in nature so if if you have a anomaly to the right you should have a similar one but in the opposite effect to the left almost one of them's going to be either stronger or weaker but you're going to have something affecting on the opposite and the white papers did state that the opposite section which they thought wasn't the likely place but they was where I have mine, which where Planet 7X is here. The little, the little blue item uh, you see right here that, that I have marked. This uh, red zone is where they, uh, for this Planet 9, but they're looking in the wrong direction. Well, 
it may have another planet that that large but you see this small little circle in the center that little light blue we have it zoomed in where jupiter and Aaron, that's the that's the outer reaches of our of our known planets like uh neptune okay in the center over here if you if you move it down some right you here. see the Mr. relationship of the small circle right that is the edge of our uh our uh, planets where uh neptune is okay for this object to affect us, like the documented parts of history shows us, it has to come within Earth's orbit. Look where they drew planet nine. It does not come inside Earth's solar system. All right, it's outside. Yeah, here's the solar system and this is outside the solar system. All right, so will it really have an effect on us? No. Will it have an effect on other, on other objects? Yes. It will warp the orbit, the orbital path of other objects, the orbital path. But w can it give us the effects that we see that's documented throughout history? Like the tilting of Earth, 26 to 28 degrees. That's like two magnets coming very close to each other and they're tilting. And then they straighten out back as, it, as it's leaving. Yeah, the, we've actually been doing collecting um, deviation of magnetic and true north now for six months of data, and and all I can tell you is the Earth is wobbling. But well, Earth has always wobbled. Yeah, but it's, it's not the normal procession. It, it's not normal procession though, Gil. It's like one night it will be twelve degrees off, and then the next night it will be like five degrees off. It's just, it's a, it's very it's been varyingly like it's what I'm telling you. That's what we've been seeing. Well, let me uh, send you an object, a, uh, a email pertaining to Wobble. Because that's been a big, uh, a big discussion, like BP was talking about it the other day too, and, and I think that's caused some confusion. And, I, and I've always understood procession to be a 26,000 or so year process, not something that happens from season to season. Am I wrong about that? No, that's the processions of the, uh, yeah, that's the, but you're not understanding the way the wobble works, okay? The earth, earth has a tilt. Do, do you know where north of the universe is? No, it's relative. Uh, no, well, no. What does science agree? What, well, I, you're asking me, do, do I know where science agrees north is? The, I would guess the, the uh, North Star. Uh, let me send you something to where you can have your orientation correct. Okay. Okay. That's what, um, let's see here. Uh, without proper orientation, that's what throws off people. Yeah, I mean, it, it throws off people's golf game, too, I've heard. Uh, yeah. See, when people uh, read scientific papers, and the scientific paper said they're looking south of the universe, where do people mostly look? Polar south, don't they? Polar south. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I would do, Gil. Yeah. yeah. But that's not the universe south. You see, in, in a white paper report dealing with astronomy that's called nadar polar south is called nadar polar north is called the zenith north south east and west on uh, astronomy is like you take a compass and you set it down on the table none of the four points point up or down got it right it's a two-dimensional representation right right North, south, east, and west is on a flat plane of the universe. It does not follow Nadar, you know, and, uh, you know, so most people are not pointing even to the correct uh, place on what uh, north, north and south is. Right, okay. And let me see, let me send you this one. But as I look at the um, the chart on the left here, the one that I have up right now, where you where you where you point out zero tilt in universe or south, um, I think what you're trying to say is that is that a, is that a normal reading we would have on that instrument? I guess would be a good question. 
would we expect it to 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 uh, vary that much over a you know the period of time it's depicted? The severity is what is wrong, not that it's uh, uh, wobbling. Okay. Is okay. the severity of the wobble has increased? It has it it has it has it has in increase a miss additional four miss degrees of of tilt. And I think that drawing is wrong. Uh, that that was done by someone who supposedly follows the wobble. And uh, according to the information that I'm reading on there, do you see that date at the bottom? This one? Uh, at the bottom of the arrow. Seven six. On the bottom of that orange arrow to the left. To the left. Oh, okay. Sorry. Day. Seven six, okay. At the bottom of the arrow, there's a seven six or seven five, whatever it is. In yeah, the last it. circle, the green dots. Right, right there. right there. Right there. Okay, now that tells you the position of Earth where it is around the sun. Okay, that's the. Um, let's see if that's right. Yeah. Uh, when you get around July six. Okay, uh, at midnight, looking south, you're looking due south of the universe there. Okay. Wow, okay, yep, I gotcha. At midnight, the sun is exactly at noon on the opposite side of you. If you're in December, around the 29th or so, at midnight, looking due south you're looking north of the universe oh, that's of course it has right. to be counterintuitive right <laughs> thank you so thank you have you. to understand where north and south is of the universe to better get this correct right and this is what you're depicting in this larger um view i guess first of all to kind of pull back and say okay here's here's the earth and the orbits therein and you're illustrating it further that our this would mean that our whole solar system has a north, south, east, and west. Correct. Uh, from an astronomical point of view. That is zero. When it when you're talking about a degree in space, that's zero, which is north. Okay, now, gotcha. Yep. This Earth, would be zero right here. Yeah. Earth tilt. Now Earth's Earth orbit is that green circle. All right? The green circle in the center. Yep. All right, that's Earth's orbit. The tilt of Earth points north of the universe, always. As, it's, as Earth is going around the sun, its tilt is toward the north of the universe. So it doesn't change. It's tilting toward the north. So, Gil, what you're saying is the magnetic, uh, is it a magnetic pull on our planet as uh, uh, Planet X comes at us? and that it tilts our planet more, the severity of the tilt is what's causing all the uh, weather anomalies that we're going through? Well, that's what I'm about to show you. You see the orange line on the other, uh, the end of the other chart, that orange arrow? Yes. You can see the wobble is much more severe in that direction. How it's very large, the wobble, from point zero which is the, the center of the axis of the Earth right there, okay? It's wobbling, the wobble is much greater towards that direction. And guess where that is? That's south of the universe. Now, where is this object coming from? Guess where? South of the universe. Wow. Where, where did NASA send the Pioneer and Voyager probe looking for this planet? South of the universe. Where is the university studies, white paper report studies, that say that the orbits of comets, planets, and moons are warped in one direction of space, south of the universe? And where exactly in the south of the universe is all this warping taking place? Sagittarius, which is where its entry is coming. You see the, uh, that red, you see elliptical orbit? On that, uh, on, on the, the other chart. chart, right? Go, go down a little bit. Uh, move the um, picture up a little bit. 
you see do you see where I marked the planet 7x right here yes okay from from the viewpoint of earth on the green circle looking towards it that's Sagittarius from the viewpoint of earth looking at that direction that's Sagittarius and for the media shower to cross earth path twice that means it has to be on the ecliptic which is where your sun passes across the sky at, and you memorize that, that, that path, that's also the path at night looking south in the universe where this object is going to come from. That's called the ecliptic. That is the only way that we can have a double meteor shower. So what you're saying is we're going to go through the tail of this thing twice? Yes. Which tell us what that means that the the uh, debris field is going to pepper our planet twice then correct severely yes um, according to the past records I can prove that we've had double media showers um, and the book of Revelation which is a future event describes the same severity or even greater. 206 is the first meteor shower, and 152 and 1-8 day later is the second meteor shower. That's CO7. He tells you the first and the beginning. He tells you, the, no, he tells you the beginning and the end, and right after that, he describes what happens in between the two. That's why CO7 is a little hard to understand. But that's the way he uh, has described other things in the Bible. He'll tell you the beginning and the end first, then he describes what happens in between that point. Whenever, whenever you get to the point where he says, and death will not come until the fifth month, that's the end of the description of what's taking place between those two points. This point and this point, right, Gil? I mean, correct, the correct. Entry and the point of exit from Earth's uh, a place on the ecliptic. Right. Earth is going to cross near the planet at the exit point, which is that second one you pointed to. This, uh, this one right here. Yes, that's where, it, it, that's around Passover right there. Oh, really? That's, remember when Yeshua, there was three hours of darkness? Oh yeah, yes, definitely. And on what day was that on, on the Hebrew calendar? Passover. Passover Eve. Okay, but yep. still, and where is the moon at on Passover Eve? I don't remember. Refresh my memory. It's a full moon. You can only have a new moon to have a solar eclipse unless you have a third body because the moon's on the wrong side of the earth. Gotcha. Yep. So it's automatically, if you look at it through astronomy eyes, the, the moon can only give you like 7.3 minutes of darkness. This was three hours, and it's on the wrong side of the Earth. How do you get three hours? You get a third object, many times larger. And the, and the model shows us it's between five to seven diameters of Earth. Exactly going along with, remember, the brightness on how far it was at, 20, at 13 months away and 13 months leaving? What would be the eye that you know a person trained eye could see it at, and everything? These numbers keep repeating. So you would be thinking that the object would be somewhere in this area now, between the orbit of Ceres and Mars. Is that what you're saying, or am I taking it too far? Well, we, I don't know. I don't have any data at the moment. The only thing we can do is give an estimate, a guess, an educated guess. Because Earth is tilted an extra four degrees in the direction, and the sun is tilted an extra six, it can't be 15 years away. 15, 16 years away puts it at the edge of Neptune's orbit. Uh, Kepler's laws of planetary motion and the model tells us this planet would take 16 years if it reached Neptune, for it to reach the sun would take 16 years. This object is a lot closer than 16 years. Uh huh. So that for it to have this severity of effects, 
Now, one of the things the Bible has multiple times is seven-year droughts. Remember right. Joseph of Egypt and, um, and a few other ones. Uh, this passes mid of the drought. You have three and a half year drought coming in, three and a half year drought as it's leaving. Remember in Revelation when the two prophets show up, uh, Elijah, that they bring with them three and a half year of drought. You see? Yep. The data is repeating. History repeats itself, especially when it's a scientific model. These, the stories of the Bible are not stories. They're historical events. There's no way that they could put this level of information that's scientifically correct with laws they have no clue of yet. Right. And I've always believed that. They have stars. Yep. Well, this goes back to, I think that you've done excellent work, you know, parsing out these different events in the Bible. See, this is another thing that I've been getting around to lately, too, is that, you know, God doesn't operate outside the laws of the universe. That's one of the things I'm convinced of. Like, in other yeah, words, he created them. Yeah, right. man is only rediscovering them. Right. That's that's my point. And it's like, you know, what God, you know, would call, you know, what a man would call magic or weirdness of some sort, you know, once you're advanced enough, you can see the science behind it, like magnetism. I mean, people back in the, in, you know, at the turn of the century didn't quite know what electricity and magnetism were, but you could just see the effects of it. So they ascribed it to, you know, any number of, of forces. But we then, as we learned, we, we became aware of differences of potential and we became, you know, aware of how, how energy flows between those two poles. And we just started to learn that stuff. And what you start to find out is that God's laws and the laws of physics are very beautiful and very predictable on one level, right, Gil? On the, on the Newtonian physics level. But when you get down into quantum, you know, it gets a little weird. But I don't think we're talking about quantum right now. We're talking about Kepler's law of planetary motion. And what you, this map that you're showing, I've seen many times, different representations of including Mike Brown, as you know, has written, you know, has been writing on it lately again. And though, and it's just showing that in order for these objects to have their elliptical orbits on the left, there has to be a balancing object on the right. That's what this thing says. And this is what uh, I think all of academia agrees with this now, right? Gil? This isn't controversial within astronomy anymore, is it? Correct. Uh, they, uh, they just that you have to prove it. That means you have to have a siding of it. Okay. Keep in mind, the larger object, Planet Nine, cannot give us a double meteor shower. It's outside our solar system. All of these arc cloud objects, you know, will not fit the scenario that we've seen multiple times in history of the double meteor showers, 150 days, by, uh, days apart, the, the, double, the, uh, the double eclipses the seven year severity of drought. Uh, it goes on and on and on. Well, like that double eclipse that's coming up first, it's coming up, this is, I was talking to David Mead about this. I, I don't know if you talked to David, but <clears throat> he has a lot of similar observations as you from the scriptural record. And, you know, he was pretty freaked out that we have this, I think it's August 21st, 2017, the yeah. eclipse that goes across North America, right, Gil? Right. And then seven, almost exactly seven years later, it comes back the other way. How rare is something like that to happen on the Earth? Well, everything is rare when you look at it as far as in the universe because time is so, so great. It's kind of like, remember you were saying the 26,000 years for the tilt of the Earth to rotate 360 degrees? Yeah, the, the, the procession, which I was learning about from Gordon Randall right. and a couple guys, yeah. So rarity is is known as whenever we come to repeating events that really to me that really <laughs> that really catches my eye right so, like rare isn't rare isn't the right word it's just it's a predictable event that happens in its time <laughs> right right now um the almighty there's an interesting word in hebrew i mean the lack of a word in hebrew the word accident there is no such hebrew word that means accident and I find yeah, that's true of a couple different cultures, Gil, but it's interesting. I never knew that about the Hebrew culture. That's interesting. Yes. 
Um, and one of the things that this proved out to me that you can have a, a planet that he uses, just like, remember, uh, when Moses and the Israelites uh, were ready to cross the Red Sea? Mm -hmm. yep. He didn't tell them to walk on, on water, did he? No. It says, what was it, an eastern wind or something like southern wind? Some came in and the waters parted and they walked across. And that was the shift, wasn't it? Right. Now, some people say, well, why would, and they get angry. Man. You're saying God has to use the planet. I said, no. I'm saying God can use anything he wants is what I'm saying. He happens to use the planet. I said, well, how come he didn't make Moses and then walk above the water? You know, walk on top. He used the wind. <coughs> yeah, why is it so why is it so hard to believe that there was a pole shift in a in a major like and we're talking when you say wind, I mean we would be talking about hundreds of miles an hour winds, right? I mean not necessarily the earth might have tilted at the same at the same time. But again, uh, it's so, like these are they're scientific like their scientific rationale, then and a person will automatically go back to you don't think that God can order events so that we run right into the right thing at the right time? I just don't know, understand why people think they're so arrogant. Like they can tell God what to do. I just I don't get it. <laughs> Stop he, telling God what to do. Throughout the Bible, he is using a lot of nature to do his bidding. Correct. Yeah, absolutely okay. correct. Uh, yep. Because he controls nature. Remember, we have to look for the moon to determine when his feast days are. Okay, he didn't have to use the moon, but he did. And he put it in orbit for us to use. Uh, uh, I think if anything, they're limiting God's power when they don't allow him to use this full power. You know, this planet's gonna shake the entire earth tremendously. Yes. Whenever it passes by. And it's uh, gonna tell, tell us that some of the things, Gil, that, that is gonna happen when it, when it passes through. Well, first, when it approaches, you, you probably get about a 40-day warning. And when you see it, it's not going to be startling. It's going to look like a, a star rounding the sun, you know, maybe a comet with a tail. It's not going to be startling. It's only going to grow in size visually to, uh, let me send you another uh, picture here. You can show it. Where I think it's about three, three days of our moon. Uh, if it's about a uh, about seven days out, it's only about half the size of our moon. Well, that's where people start to get uh, worried when it's about a week to two weeks out. I've seen this over and over. If you live anywhere on the Gulf Coast where there's hurricanes, you, you know that people panic very late in the game. Yeah. They, they don't take heed. Well, people from Louisiana know that, uh, know that really well, don't they, Gil? Anybody that lives on Texas and it's Louisiana and Florida, and in uh, Mississippi, we know it very well. I'm going to send you some more stuff to take a look at. You, sure. Uh, it Just gives turn. you. Just turn down. Uh, uh, the and, and one of the biggest problems is uh, because people live in, that live in that area have seen so many uh, hurricanes, they're like, oh, I've, I've sat it out. I, you know. And then when it starts getting where it's un, un, unable to be handled, then at the last minute they try to get out, and that this is one of the things that we're trying to warn people about is that you know we're trying to prepare people not to wait to the last minute to try to survive. That's what this whole conference that's coming up is about: getting giving people the heads up on how to prepare and what steps to take, uh, so they aren't taking for granted the wait to the last minute. Yeah, yeah, and I, go ahead, Will. Sorry. The um, yeah, uh, just that uh, if 
if they don't have enough enough knowledge of astronomy, enough knowledge of the Bible, and enough knowledge of general science and physics, they're missing out. Remember, he says, my people die of lack of knowledge. He didn't say they die of lack of religion. He said, or lack of faith. He said, lack of knowledge. And the Bible is full of knowledge. But people are not uh, not open to the facts that he's given us and they are rejecting a lot of it because of because it doesn't fit their their uh, perception on, on on the way it should be they're following their heart and the bible says one who follows their heart is a fool you follow what the bible literally is saying and the factual points of it and when you do that you find out that he's extremely real extremely extremely precise and he's warning you ahead of time so well i think that you know the the finer points are starting to fall away i think the science is starting to come to the fore i think there's been you know a lot of guessing and a lot of different things but what i think is interesting gil is in the last couple of years people are feeling something is coming it's you know it's it, i'm not i'm going to move away from science for a minute and just talk about how people feel people just feel and sense this you know what i'm saying does that, does that make sense yeah i mean uh, they can feel the like i want to say like a sense of doom kind of or foreboding you know go ahead well they have to sense that something's wrong look anybody that you can talk to any farmer that deals or any person that deals in the in the elements the weather they all tell you that something's wrong they never seen weather and seasons that are off as much as we have. Uh, even the Eskimos in the north saying that the sun doesn't set in the same place, which is true because of the wobble of the earth has caused the earth to set slightly different, about four degrees. Let me give you a, uh, a example on how far four degrees really is. All right? Okay. When you look in the in the nighttime sky and you look at the moon, that's a half a degree. So the, half width of the moon, yeah, the diameter of the moon is one half of one degree of the sky, is what you're saying. A half of a degree, yes. Okay. Yep. Not one and a half, but a half of a degree. Okay. If you hold up your uh, uh, your finger, your little finger, at arm's length <coughs> in the sky. The width of your little finger, at it doesn't matter the height of the person, or you know, this is the same proportions. You hold your arm up out at arm's length and you hold up your small finger. Your little finger is the width of one degree. Okay, you're just twice as wide as the moon. Earth's tilt has changed four degrees. That's eight diameters of the moon over. So the next time that you're in the sky, picture eight diameters of the moon over and that's where the moon the sun and different things have shifted about four degrees when it's in its extreme wobble uh area which is which is when it's in the southern the southern area uh when it when we get to uh uh july this is where earth's wobble is the most extreme and guess what? That's when Earth is the closest to our planet. You know? Yeah. It's it's. Uh, I've got your I've got your emails now though. Do, w w did you want me to walk through a couple of these with you, Gil? Did you want to share some stuff about them? Uh, well, the the one you have right there. See, the object, the planet, will come in in a counterclockwise ro rotation which is very similar to most of our planets like Halley's Comet will come in in a clockwise Mr. rotation this one comes in in a counterclockwise like this guy so it's a kind of a hybrid between a planet and a comet this is going to be probably a whole new category of an item yeah that's what Ferrata used to say about that what do you think of his research Gil 
he's right on he's right on on the description but he didn't have the data to give the orbit because that's Remember, the, yeah go ahead if you plot a 3600 year orbit on this model and kept the entry and exit at 150 days the back side of this uh, ellipse would go past Earth's orbit on the other. It would cross Earth's orbit four times. If you try to keep 150 days uh, separation between the two. Yeah, that would be simple geometry right there now, wouldn't it? Right, right. So if it's not 150 days, then it's going to be a considerably wider and it won't even cross Earth's path. It's either going to cross Earth's path four times or none at all if it has the 3,600-year orbit. And guess what? For it to have a 3,600-year orbit, it has to be multiple times larger than Jupiter to get out, to have enough mass for the Earth to send it out that deep in space. The, the deeper it is in space, the larger the object should be, or denser. Mm -hmm. The weight of it has to be heavier. And again, it's all geometry, guys, because it's the distance between the entry and the exit points is it, it actually, it, you can predict the amount of time it would take to orbit and with the n numbers of, of mass, you could, you could actually predict speed and everything like that. It, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me, guy. I never heard anybody uh, explain it that way. That you, in can order read, to, yep. you, you, you can read Dr. Harrington's papers. Yep. He and many other ones were estimated around five to six times. Well... The Bible tells us that we can't have a meteor shower over an hour. Well, that means it can't be over seven diameters of Earth at the angle that it comes in in March or April. So that's the maximum size of seven. And the smaller size is somewhere around five. Otherwise, it'd have a shorter, uh, you see, elliptical orbit than 360 years. Well, I think the first thing that, it, you know, would be, you know, if, if what you're saying is, is factual, I, and I have no reason to believe not, that that means that the first time we go through the tail, and I believe that all the events are setting up politically for this as well, where I really truly believe they're going to use that, that period to lock down their control on the Earth. I don't think it's going to, you know, that's what I think is going to happen. I think it's going to be the B system, just as the Bible predicts. I, I'm, they I'm have to, really one of the signs that you will know that this object is close, and I've said that on multiple interviews, when it gets close enough for astronomers to see it with their own telescope, and I mean for them to, you know, they have to allow us to see it at one given point or not. They got to turn off what's cloaking it. When that happens. Well, that's the part that I wanted to get into because my research has taken, uh, our WSO's research, We've been very much uh, almost indisputable evidence of cloaking technologies that they're using to hide it. Yes, they're 30 years ahead of what you're seeing in, in, the, in the YouTube videos in, in, in laboratories. They're 30 to 50 years ahead of that. Yeah, we had a guy. So, so when, they, when they turn the cloaking device off, what's going to happen, Gil? Then we would see it like a star. And then... People with an astronomy, I mean, with a telescope, will be able to zoom in and give you close-up pictures that are not blurry. They'll be detailed, just like we look at uh, Jupiter or Mars. Okay, they'll be detailed. Yeah, uh, enough to tell you that it's a real planet. Uh, when see, there's a difference when you try to zoom in a telescope on a mirage, which is a sun dog. When you try to zoom in. With uh, with equipment, it gets blurrier, blurry. Okay, it does not get sharp. Only a real object, when you zoom in, will get sharp. Yeah, and that's been the frustrate the frustrating part of this, and it's caused so much confusion. Is that I really don't believe I don't believe amateur astronomers, you know, can overcome the cloaking technology yet. I just don't think they have, you know. If they're if they're in, intentionally if, hiding from us, if they could. I can't expect, yeah. I can't they expect could. an astronomer to see yeah. it. Go ahead, Joe. I'm sorry. Uh, if they could get past it, then there would be no need for them to use cloaking, uh, 
cloaking. Okay, so of course they can't. Otherwise, they wouldn't be using it. That's why Reagan put it up there. He started the program in 85. They had it up and running by 90, 92, 1992. Yeah, okay. That's that's history I didn't know. Because I remember uh, I was in the military in, from 82 to 86, and I can remember him making speeches about the Star Wars that just was a little like, huh? Like, what? <laughs> right? You know, nobody, everybody, and then they, remember how much uh, pressure they came under when there was the huge budget battle in the early 80s, and they were like, the anti-missile defense would never work anyway, and you could, you know, now looking back at it, you could see them saying, well, good thing we're not spending it on that. We're spending it on trying to cloak this thing, <laughs> right? Gosh. Well, yeah. he, well, went to, he went to the yeah. extent of having the word nuclear <laughs> removed from the dictionary. You see the same laser equipment. You see, you see, the same laser laser equipment can do three things. It can be a, it's a defense against uh, ICBM. It can be a defense against small meteors. It can create holograms in the sky, and it can cloak an object. <coughs> it has multiple capabilities. Yeah, I, th I don't think they just they put up that. By the way, we're getting a little bit of a background noise, guys. We'll try to get that out before I put this up. But um, just to let you know, but um, there, you know, this is one of the aspects of the of the planetary proximity that you know one of the things I've always thought about Mars was that it got too close to Planet X, you know, Seven X, in your in the way you put it. I it did. It was. It was after. after yeah. yeah. Whenever, whenever it destroyed Ceres coming in. The forward speed of Planet uh, Planet X slowed down to one twentieth of its normal speed, and you can see this in the biblical records. Uh, what you see in in the biblical records is that right after the Exodus, uh, it came back around for Joshua's long day, which was only fifty-two years. Well, it made it didn't have enough speed to go out into deep space. It had to return and gain speed as it goes around the sun, because the sun throws it out there like a slingshot. So it took four more trips around the sun before it gained its normal speed. So each time it progressively got into deeper space, deeper and deeper, and its speed was increased. So that's why you see in the biblical records. Uh, it uh, moves from 52 years to 131 years to 336, then to a normal orbit of 358, which was Hezekiah. Well, somewhere in between here, I believe it was the, the 52 years, but after that, it didn't go very far. It just went out to about Mars's orbit. And, or, and so it's turning around, and Mars is right next to it getting the discharges of plasma at a very prolonged time. And that's what cut that canyon. Yeah, and I don't, the I don't surface have, of it. I don't have a picture of Mars handy right now, but I'll, you know, guys, I'll try to stick with it. But you know, there's a huge gash on the side of Mars. If you've ever looked at pictures of the, you know, of the telescope pictures or the close up pictures that we've taken of it. And it's a hideous, huge cannon, our uh, canyon. And it, it, it's, it, it's pretty conventionally thought of as a huge lightning strike across the surface. So I think, pretty, you know, the, there's the, it's not pseudoscience anymore. We think it was an electrical interaction with another body, I guess is what I'm trying to tell you. Well, it's, whenever you say lightning, uh, people think of the normal lightning we have. Um, I have to give them a scale to size. You should have uh, some pictures there, I think, that I sent you. Uh, some of those, some of those, e some of the emails have three, four, and five pictures on them. Uh, if you go find the one about the eye, the eye of the Sahara. That's in Africa. You have pictures of it. Yep, I'm grabbing it right now, Gil. That is a plasma. This uh, discharge that hit Earth, which I personally. I believe it was around Hezekiah's time, about 700 BC. That crater is 30 miles across. Uh, this is uh, it's uh, not that one. You should have one that shows the 
eye of the Sahara. Okay. Uh, and uh, that lightning bolt was 30 miles across. Now, if a lightning bolt 30 miles across was to hit, hit let's say, uh, or let's say uh, uh, Missouri, okay? It would probably take out the next, oh, eight or 10 sta states around it that all of the electrical equipment would be burned, you know, fried because of the electrically charged particles. Uh, it'd be like a small EMP in the, in the surrounding area. You know, it, the lightning would charge the air and you don't have to hit the uh, electronics with it. It just needs to be in charged particles of air. So wherever these lightning, uh, these plasma, discharges are going to hit on earth well they're going to be sent to the stone age yeah it's like the ultimate like space weapon right i mean it's like Geet. it's yeah. huge and we actually have a uh, a misrecording of this this is when uh, uh, uh comet sighting springs passed by mars you should have a picture of that too i sent you Okay. Uh, some of those you have to flip through me see the emails because there's two or three in the same in the same email. Yeah, this one here. <clears throat> right. You can see that Mars was lit up in the bottom right corner simply because you see that small dot on the screen that says comet siding springs. Well, when that tail crossed uh, Mars. It lit up Mars like an entire light light bulb. Well, instead of a rock as small as what you see on there, think of a planet that's seven times larger than the Earth that's doing the same thing. That discharge is going to be a lot bigger. Yeah, this discharge, um, the re Rickot, I think that's pronounced Rickot structure, right? Um, right. This, that, I mean, th it, that, that to me is what, when I think of an interplanetary uh, plasma discharge, that's what I think would happen right there. <laughs> that's what I would imagine. Well, Gil, are you yeah. saying that th this is going to be like a giant EMP also? Uh, you started to tell us what the signs were. So could you uh, elaborate on that for us a little bit about how well, what's going to happen? Nobody living has been through this, so I can only speculate. I can't say that it's going to be the entire Earth is going to be hit with the EMP. I'm trying to give the best results that only surrounding countries on where it hit would be affected. I, I'm not sure if the whole Earth would go... Uh, uh, know if it was up the whole earth but you see in other words when earth starts to go through the plasma table i have a picture of that which is roughly three days prior to the crossing they have to announce they have to turn off all generators globally you see because that plasma is too strong uh, it's like uh oh uh, a solar flare from the sun hitting, hitting the earth right there constantly. So they have to turn off all generators globally. Now this is at the same time that Elijah and Moses show up for Passover. That's a nighttime event. And guess what? The nighttime on earth is going to be the safe side. Right. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. But you know, what? One of the things I wanted to ask you about is I've been noticing a lot of trouble with nuclear plants lately. It just seems like all of a sudden, all these nuclear plants are leaking or having some kind of problems or shutting down reactors. I'm starting to wonder if this isn't part of that power shutdown that you're talking about, Gil. 
It is because certain older reactors takes 18 months almost for them to shut them down, to cool them off enough. So the, the older ones, they got to shut down early. The newer ones, you have less and less time to do it, you know, to, to, where, the, to where the water doesn't let me see evaporate off of them. When it's totally cool, it's cold. So that, so that would be a sign for us that they're preparing for this coming in, correct? Well, if there's enough of them, yes. Uh, but I'm not saying that, that it, it's reached that point yet right now. I'm just saying maybe no, have. We need to see more. Gil and Bad Baby, I mean, just to bring you some information, is that, you know, it's, it's kind of just started poking its head up in the last three months where multiple reactors across the country are all of a sudden having maintenance issues and, you know, leaks and all kinds of stuff <laughs> never heard about with these things before. So either the news is getting way better or or they're 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 shutting down nuclear plants. <laughs> you know what I mean? In the process, I mean it's an eighteen month. The, process. the side of the earth that's going to be facing the, the side of the earth that's going to be facing the daylight side, which you have a picture of that. Yep. That side is going to be hit by a meteor shower in March, March April, whatever wherever. Um, uh, whatever month that Passover is falling in. But right there, uh, just like it shows right there, uh, okay, the daylight side is gonna be hit. The nighttime side of Earth is the safe side, okay? Because that's facing away from the meteor shower. And there's only a biblical model, and the model proves out correctly in our model when we use the plasma universe, that Earth will slow down by 12 hours. That means the actual side of Earth that the astronomers are gonna to predict to be hit will be the wrong side, the wrong half of the Earth, because they do not compensate for a 12 hour delay in Earth rotation. Ah, yes, go ahead, yep. This, this is the false miracle of the Antichrist. He will claim that he's changing the Earth's rotation, and that he's saving the Islamic nations, which is the Mahdi. This is the false miracle our Bible tells us about, because it's already declared in our text, if you understand what he's telling. Remember when I said, it says he sends the four angels to the four corners of the Earth to stop the winds? Yes. The only way the winds stop is Earth, is Earth rotation stopping. Then there's another part in the Bible that says in the end days, uh, I will make night into day and day into night. Well, that's a 12 hour delay because the eclipse only gives you darkness. It doesn't give you light. Right, and the eclipse only lasts for seven minutes, not for a whole day. Right, so you can't get that model. It has to be a 12 hour delay to, th to change uh, Daylight into night and night into day, that's a 12. That's like saying I'm going to change noon into midnight, midnight into noon. That's a 12 hour delay. It's telling us that. Yeah, look at you deducting everything over there, Gil Brizard. Using the process of deduction to teach us science. Whoa, whoa, whoa back <laughs> off here a little bit. <laughs> Just kidding. No, I have to throw a joke in every so often. I know it's a serious subject and a super serious topic, and I try to just break it up a little bit because it's so profound you know what is going on and it's not just Gil Brazard uh you know making these connections and you know to the biblical record it's also people like David Mead have, who's also done a lot of the same analysis Gil and me, your your stuff met up pretty close let me show you how exact I was just showing you how exact it is in Revelation but let me prove to you how exact it was in just two stories in the Bible sure well, we've already mentioned Yeshua's sacrifice on how exact that was. Well, going back to Joseph of Egypt, remember he had a dream at age 17 where the sky, sun, and moon um, bowed to him in a dream? One of my favorite stories in the Bible. Okay. Through uh, astronomy eyes, I have a problem with that. You can't see the stars if the sun is out. So that word in ancient Hebrew is illuminated body. It could be our object, a comet, or a planet. 
then you can still see the stars. Yeah, again, uh, common sense applied <laughs> to the story would simply say, I mean, it would suggest that, right? right? Now, now that's A17. He was not in charge of uh, in Egypt till he was in his 30s, and then after uh, around 40, he was exactly 40 years old. That was mid of the drought, three and a half year drought. Remember, I told you, I have three and a half year drought coming in, three and a half year drought as it leaves. Mid of that drought, we have the Nebra disc, the sky disc of Nebra. And it proves to us, because of the patterns on there, that Earth tilted 26 to 28 degrees. And this is when, the, from a viewpoint from Earth, the skies bowed to Joseph when he was 40. He had the dream at 17, but it didn't come true until he was 40, mid of the drought. And that's what the Nebra sky that shows us. And I'm getting a picture of the Nebra sky just for everybody to see here. Now, how about Joe? Uh, uh, if you go to, uh, let's see, uh, Joshua's long day. Yeah, when they were in battle and the day was extended. He was outnumbered 10 to 1. He had 30,000 men. The enemy was 300,000. And they're fighting hand to hand. That's extremely close with a sword, okay? And the detail says only the meteors were hitting the enemy, not none of Joshua. The reason for that, the moon was just in the exact position in front of us shielding Joshua's men from the meteors and only allowing the meteors to hit the enemy. Do you see how precise the Almighty is? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that Revelation, yeah, Revelation is full of details that people fail to understand because they're not using the knowledge of the science that the Almighty gave us to understand where to be and what time to be there because his feast days are not vain religious acts. They're rehearsal patterns getting you in the right place at the right time. And Passover is one of the times that you're supposed to practice that in Jerusalem. But this next Passover, when this planet comes around, don't miss that appointed time. And the other time that you're supposed to practice is Sukkot. Sukkot teaches you how to build temporary shelters. Guess what that is? That's about six months before Passover. Wow. And, and I didn't know what Sukkot was until I went to Jerusalem. I've never heard the term before. Um, so basically there's a, there's a part of leading up to Passover six months prior to where you're, where you're actually supposed to make a, a temporary shelter. Is that what you're saying? It's not leading up to Passover. This is just a practice run. Just a practice run in, in, in you know. These are, these are dry rehearsal. The word in Hebrew means dry rehearsal. It doesn't mean feast. You can have a feast in a dry rehearsal, but the rehearsal is not a, a feast. You see, you got to put it in the correct kind of connotation. These are dry rehearsal that he's having you practice. He says, Sukkot, you're supposed to go to Jerusalem and practice building temporary. It's about a week long. That's a practice run. You know why? Because the last six months of this thing's approach, and not until I went to Jerusalem did I figure out why. The, the buildings are made out of stone blocks. They can't take being shaken. The buildings won't be safe. They, people have to live in temporary shelters. They'll have to go outside until all this shaking, all of the uh, uh, quaking is stopped which is the last six months of his approach and probably the last six months as it's leaving. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You, I, I see how your how your uh, all these things fit together and bad baby. The only reason I'm muting you is because we're getting a little feedback. I'm going to unmute you. Do you have any, any comments real quick? Oh, that's okay, honey. I kind of figured I, my mic was uh, messing up again. No, it sounds uh, good. No. Right now. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, I did a few things uh, while I was muted. So, uh, 
Yeah, and I just wanted to ask Gil, you know, uh, we were talking about what the, uh, the elite plan on doing that will give us some signs, and I want him to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, what he thinks about these uh, FEMA camps and what will go down uh, when this all starts to occur. The, uh, well, the first question, I believe that he's already given us the lead if we're listening to him and following him. I believe if we follow the Sukkot principle of going to Jerusalem, that's roughly, you know, we don't know which Sukkot is going to be, but we should be practicing them. And that we will be in, in, we uh, see Jerusalem, at the correct time, before it's announced, before we can, you know, really see it. We might see it once we're over there. But after that, they probably will cause global terrorism and plane flights won't be flying. I think that's the reason why he has us in Jerusalem for Sukkot, to be there ahead of time. If you're following his rehearsal patterns and then oh, fascinating we're, stuff. we're wow. actually staying there until passover and keep in mind the night that the generators are turned off globally is the same night of passover when elijah and moses show up it's a private meeting because when electricity goes there's no tv or radio no one to announce that they showed up Remember, the Bible says, for adulterous and wicked generation, this world will only have one warning, the sign of Jonah. That's the 40-day warning. Will be the only warning this wicked and adulterous world will have. His people who follow his instructions and practice these rehearsal patterns, these dry runs, will be at the right place at the right time because his information is exact. Wow, that's a good place to, to, to kind of, you know, bring it to a close. And, and Gil, I can't tell you how thankful and bad baby, I'm thankful for you too, but thankful, Gil, that you took time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us and share this information. Um, that's, you've given us a lot to think about, sir. Say that again? I said you've given us a lot to think about. Okay. Um, all right. Good. I'm glad. Study, study his word and understand that these are not vain religious acts. They are actual factual uh, in all respects. And he's telling us where to be at the right time. And he says, follow his moral laws. He tells you the right way to uh, adjust the person's attitude and live correctly. That's what his laws are about. Well, the thing that the, the other thing that occurs to me when we think about this kind of thing is how temporary everything really is. You know, this is a dynamic cosmos that we live in. And one of the things that I look at when I see this coming and what it, I don't know, it's had a negative effect on human race, but I'm not sure if it's all negative because it sure seems like, and I, I know this is going to sound terrible saying this, but it is getting so evil right now, Gil. I, I can't take it. It's too evil. Yeah. It's like you can't look anywhere without seeing evil. It's just horrible. I, I didn't mean to get off on a tangent. No, the Bible warns us. This is the time of Jacob's trouble. They're going to try to destroy the city. And remember, the Jews are only one tribe of Jacob, or two maybe. All right? They've still got the other tribes that are scattered throughout the world. Remember, he said that there would be nations of nations, plural, plural. So we can't just say it's only it, you know, the Israel we see today. That's singular. Yeah, it's going to be multiple. Yeah, he was referring to a geography in that. No, I don't believe he was referring to geography at all. Right. So there's, they're going. The enemy's trying to wipe out the seed of Jacob, Jews and Christians, basically. If you want to do a, a broad, a uh, broad stroke, this analogy, that's what they're after. And he said they would cut off your heads. Have you seen anybody having their heads cut off lately? Yes. 
Oh my okay. God! And this is and this is why they have the uh, guillotines in the FEMA camps. Well, the uh, I mean, it, it's a big puzzle, isn't it, Gil? And if you put the puzzle together, it's not that hard to figure out, is it? We've talked to people who were scheduled to be managers of these FEMA camps. They already told us what it's for. These are the people who end up being homeless. When you lose your home because the economy has collapsed and, you know, and you're on the street sleeping, they pick you up. Yep, they're they already doing it. I, I seen an article where in uh, California, this guy was, actually I saw a video. He had his iPhone and he was going, what are all these homeless people, their shopping carts are all lined up here and the people are gone. And they didn't know where they went. And they said, why would someone homeless leave their purse in the shopping cart? Because they were rounded up. Well, again, this is the time to, you know, to get close to God at this point in history. I've been saying it over and over again. But, uh, Gil, thanks for, yeah, the, the FEMA camps, the, the dots are connecting. You know, things are getting weird. It's important to stay in, uh, in the loop on this stuff. And, and Gil, I wanted to also, before I let you go, a lot of the people that are trying to learn this over the last couple of years, you've been really valuable to us. Um, I would not know any of this information that you're showing, right, obviously, yeah. if you hadn't if you hadn't have done the research. And you know, you help you help this community to understand it uh, a lot better. And thank you for that. Well, Missy, you welcome. I just, I just did a, a, you know, I had to, I had to end up learning Hebrew because I was I had to go back and look at look up the old records because part of our English does, is not interpreted correctly. In the Hebrew, it states things correctly, and some of the English because they didn't know what they were trying to interpret. It. They didn't have an idea of planets and and any of this. And when you go back and start, you know. Look at the actual Hebrew. You start to find these uh, these uh, particular points. Right on. And yep. All right. Well, thanks, Gil. And we're looking forward to hopefully talking to you again soon. I know you're, uh, you know, considering to participate with our. We hope you do with the um, Thrival conferences, and we'll get that worked out later. But I just, again, I need to thank you because, you know, when you when I first started to try to research this, Gil. Um, it was really hard to find information that had meat to it. You know what I'm saying? Where you, it wasn't somebody channeling a Zeta reticuli or, you know what I'm saying? It was like a person doing science. And um, I think you've always been that way. And, uh, you know, just congratulations about that. And can't wait to talk to you again well, soon. Have you back on the show. Well, thank you. Uh, just try to stay grounded and, um, and be factual to the people because, you you owe it to them you know uh, it's a it's a privilege to have people's ear but make sure you telling them as close to the facts that you understand it to be yep that's that's and, all i can do really i mean and then have other experts that have studied it better or more de in depth like david like you like bob evans like gerald clark even though they come from different perspectives i, I found it helpful to look at different people's points of view but the, 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 I will tell you what's remarkable about what's going on right now is how aligned it is to the scriptures. It, that, that is undeniable. The way events lay out and the way the scriptures have, have predicted it, that to me is pretty, pretty easy to see. Without yeah. a doubt. Yeah. And um, there's, there is no way they could guess consecutively correct 14 different times and give us a future event at the level that they've given it. They've given us satellite points of view. They've given all kinds of things. You know, like they say the earth, it's hit so hard that it wobbles like a drunkard. That's the view from space. Okay, last time I checked. Yeah, I don't think so, you can see the earth, you know, being a drunkard unless you were seeing it from space, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> and there's a few other points in there too that it's, uh, it's, it's a new point. And I think that's what it comes down to, ma'am, because when this thing type of thing shows up in the sky and, you know, and you in, in, in the Bible tells us that men's hearts will fail them for fear because they, they, ha they hadn't known about it. 
you know, that's what we're hopeful that these shows do is to help you so that when you start to see these things, you're not in a place of fear and catatonic, but you're in a place where you can act. And that's another thing that we're trying to do here. So. All right, Steve. Uh, thank you for your time. And um, thank you. you so much, Gil, for coming on tonight. Yep. And I'm really looking forward to meeting you in person if you come to the conference. All right. Uh, Steve, I have one other thing that I learned when I was in uh, uh, Jerusalem with the rabbis. Oh, please share. Their text, and I never shared this with any of you prior, prior to this. Uh, the rabbis in their text says that this object has seven moons. And that yeah. caught my attention because I never said it to anyone. But, but we have a friend of mine had forwarded to me. Uh, before I ever met the rabbis, we had, you know, where they showed a dragon and the, and the sun all, you know, they always show a dragon with a, with a large uh, spherical object in the center. Yeah. Well, some of these show seven objects in front of it. Exactly seven. Multiple pictures of it. Yeah. And they, and they drew. These are seven moons. That's why it was misinterpreted as a mini solar system, but it's not a mini system because it wouldn't have a natural elliptical orbit. It would have well, a, See, that was the it, thing that the, you really did kind of crush that for once and for all for me just now because I could never jive what Ferrata was saying and what you were saying. I could never jive the 7X idea, and there's this, this whole body of thought that thinks we're dealing with a brown dwarf. And, I, not you know, again... This isn't a normal planet. Like, for example, as you start to study Venus, uh, if, you, if you've ever, you'll notice that Venus doesn't have its own electrical field. It doesn't generate a magnetic field like the Earth does. It would be considered like a comet planet, right? You start to put these little pieces together and you start to say to yourself, wow, you know. It, 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 Venus, it, Venus is more a moon that was dropped off from our planet, you know. Uh, because it doesn't have the characteristic of a true planet. Well, and that's it doesn't the thing that have I could, a I magnetic jive. field. Yeah, I could never jive the yeah. idea of brown dwarf because that would seem to me that that would cause way more devastation than what could be, you know, explained in the in like for example, what you point out the biblical record and other records, right? Um, a brown dwarf would be a ELE, man. That would be the end of it. Yes, no. it would only have passed once, and it would have dragged us into deeper space. Right, it, it would have it, had to have if it would, yeah. But because it, because this object came so close to us, Earth tilted at least three to four times in its path. It tilted 20, uh, 26 to twenty-eight degrees tilt is what the numbers keep generating and showing us that we have solid information on that. It doesn't flip a hundred the 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 magnetic fields might flip. You see, when a magnet is hit by lightning, the magnetic fields flip on a magnet. When Earth is going to be hit with this plasma strike, the magnetic north, which is different than the geographic north, the magnetic north will flip 180. But the geographic north, when it gets close enough, it will tilt 26 to 28 degrees. Wow. And again, these, all these numbers are lining right up with, yeah. Wow. All right, Gil, I got to let you go. I, I, I just can't tell you how much I appreciate this information and guys, everybody have a good night and uh, thanks again, Gil. All right. Bye-bye.